Hi, I'm Trim Parado, Public Affairs Officer at NASA Headquarters in Washington, and welcome to NASA's Asteroid Initiative Opportunities Forum. We have a number of exciting presentations and discussions planned for you today about the Asteroid Initiative. Uh, for those maybe unfamiliar with it, or for those of you watching from home, uh, learning about the Asteroid Initiative, it comprises a, a number of different components. It's an asteroid grand challenge to develop new partnerships and collaborations to accelerate NASA's existing planetary defense work. It's an asteroid redirect mission to capture and redirect an asteroid, and a crewed mission to help send astronauts to visit it and collect samples. You'll hear an update on all of the planning for all of these activities uh, more today. And throughout the day, we'll post presentations online at www.nasa.gov slash asteroid forum. You can find out more information generally about the Asteroid Initiative through that link or at nasa.gov slash asteroid initiative. Um, we'll have a few opportunities for you to ask uh, questions of our panelists today. Uh, you can start sending those questions in via Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, to get us started, though, I'd like to show a short video just highlighting some of the mission concepts and activities that you'll be hearing more about today, if we can roll that. Okay, and now for opening remarks, it's my pleasure to introduce NASA Administrator Charles Bolden. Charlie? Wow, you guys are quiet. Uh, you know, you can relax. Uh, if you don't, uh, you may as well not get too serious here. Um, I want to thank you, Trent, for, in, for the introduction, and thanks to everybody who's come to join us today. Uh, for this important progress update on NASA's Asteroid Initiative. And I know we have people who are looking uh, on NASA TV, probably people online, as I see Rebecca down there just busily looking at tweets and twits and all that other stuff. So let me thank uh, some people first. I want to thank Michelle Gates, who's right down here in front. I want to thank Chris Moore, Jason Kessler, and the whole team for leading this effort. And special appreciation uh, for today goes to Aaron Mahoney and to Sarah Becca Ramsey, uh, Becky Ramsey, uh, for organizing today's forum. Uh, one of the things that, that we've learned after 50 years of space exploration is that our solar system is too big for any one of us to get our hands around. That's why NASA has always sought and welcomed input from scientists, educators, corporations, students, and citizens from all walks of life. And you've always answered the call. None of our great accomplishments, from landing a man on the moon, to assembling the ISS in space, to landing Curiosity rover on Mars, would have been possible without the ingenuity and support of the American people. I'm especially pleased that we have representatives from the next generation of scientists and explorers with us today, sitting right down here. Uh, I'm talking about the Dillard Drive Middle School Asteroid Search Team. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. If you all have not met these young men and women right down here and their teacher who looks younger, would you all stand up for a second and just kind of wheel around so people can see you? They're not here. <laughs> they didn't come just to have fun. Uh, I hope they're going to have some fun while they're here. They are here because they think their ideas are better than a lot of you sitting in the audience, and they are serious about it, and you ought to talk to them. You will see them when they give their presentation later on today. Uh, they've done a lot of work, and, and they're really proud, and I think their parents, any, are the parents back up in here? You all stand up, because you know parents don't get, don't get recognized enough. And there's one uh, right on the end is a granddad, so he and I had a special uh, aff affinity this morning because I was telling him about my three granddaughters. Um, but that's really special. Let, let me um, 
Before I go ahead, I need to make sure everybody understands something. We really make a big deal out of this initiative, but you should all understand this is a tiny, tiny piece of getting humans to Mars. Uh, I don't want anybody to lose focus on that. The, the ultimate goal of this agency right now when it comes to human spaceflight is to put humans on Mars, and that's hard. That is really hard. So we need a proving ground to develop some of the technologies and everything else, and, and the concept with which we have arrived is, is the asteroid initiative, and, and we are going to talk about it in some detail. But, but I don't want, you are all asteroid people. Um, you're very important. The ultimate thing, though, is to put boots on the ground on Mars, and that's not just to do a touch and go. I mean, it's to live there one of these days. And I, I always have to, I, when I look at the audience, um, I always recognize that many of you are my generation. We're not going to do this, okay? Uh, so some of you will scoff. Some of you are going, yay, I'm glad we're finally doing this because we've been talking about it for 100 years or more. Uh, not very many of us are going to do it. I told these young, I told the kids down here this morning, it's up to them to be quite honest. So that's why I was really, really, really glad to see that we had a group of, of seventh graders who are engaged in this. They're the ones that are going to do it. It's not any, it is, let me tell you, as I look back there and see all my friends up in this middle section, you guys are toast. <laughs> you know, you are not going to do this. You're setting the ground and they're the ones that are going to do it. So just, just uh, you know, get over it. Uh, as some of you may already know, NASA's asteroid initiative is comprised of an, uh, an asteroid grand challenge and a three-segment strategy to identify and interact with Earth-threatening asteroids. The grand challenge seeks to develop new partnerships and collaborations to accelerate NASA's existing planetary defense work. The three-segment strategy includes, as a first segment, our ongoing effort to identify and characterize as many of the Earth-threatening asteroids as feasible. The second segment, a robotic mission to redirect an asteroid into a stable orbit around the moon. And the third segment, a crewed visit to that asteroid by astronauts via SLS and Orion, during which samples can be collected for return to Earth. You'll hear more about these complementary parts of the asteroid initiative from our panel of experts. But today's forum is not only about us talking to you about where we are and where we're going. Uh, with our asteroid initiative. It's most importantly about you sharing your thoughts and ideas about this exciting and important adventure. Last year, we issued a call for ideas on the asteroid redirect mission and the asteroid grand challenge. We received more than 400 responses, 96 of which were explored in depth at a two-part workshop in Houston. Um, I'm trying to remember, it became two-part because we didn't have a hurricane, but we had something down there. Oh, that's right. Congress shut the government down. Uh, in that small, in that same spirit, last Friday, we released a broad agency announcement, or BAA, seeking proposals on an asteroid redirect mission concepts development. The BAA seeks input and ideas to include asteroid capture systems, rendezvous sensors, adapting commercial spacecraft, for the asteroid redirect mission and feasibility studies of potential future partnership opportunities for secondary payloads and the crewed mission. We are also aligning our agency infrastructure to better manage this effort. Just this week, Associate Administrator Robert Lightfoot announced the consolidation of two asteroid mission concept teams into one and assigned specific project duties to the various NASA centers across the country to get us to the next mission definition milestone. Robert may tell you more about that when he wraps up today's forum with a discussion, to, with a discussion of our next steps. But before we get into the meat of today's forum, let me take a moment to tell you how all this fits into NASA's grand vision for a new era of space exploration. Our asteroid initiative is part of a stepping stone approach focused on meeting the President's bold challenge of sending humans to Mars in the 2030s. The grand challenge that dovetails with the identification and characterization segment of the strategy includes enhanced near-Earth observation, detection, and characterization, which will extend our understanding of NEO threats 
while providing additional opportunities for investigation of asteroids and demonstrations of technologies and capabilities. The robotic mission to redirect an asteroid will help us develop technologies, including solar electric propulsion, needed for future deep space missions. The third element, the crewed mission to an asteroid, will allow us to practice orbital maneuvering away from low Earth orbit environment. It will also develop procedures for proximity operations and extravehicular activity from the Orion crew module that will be necessary for a human mission to Mars, our ultimate goal in our global exploration roadmap. During this astronaut visit, we will collect samples for return to Earth and practice procedures that might be used, might, I say, be used in future commercial mining. You should also know that the International Space Station, ISS, is a critical part of our stepping stone approach to the exploration of deep space and Mars. The administration's commitment to extend the life of the ISS until at least 2024 guarantees we'll have this unique op orbiting opportunity uh, outpost for at least another decade. This means an expanded market for commercial space companies. It will also allow time for more groundbreaking research and science discovery in microgravity and additional opportunities to live, work, and learn in space over longer and longer periods of time. As we continue to perform research aboard the ISS, we're also making strides in transitioning cargo and crew transportation to the station uh, to commercial space companies, ending our dependence on Russian and return, and return launches to American soil. Already, two companies, SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, are making regular cargo deliveries to the International Space Station. Last year, we'll, later this year, we'll move beyond commercial cargo resupply and award contracts to American aerospace companies to send our astronauts to low Earth orbit. Most important is that this will end our reliance on Russia for the transportation of our crews to the ISS. If Congress fully funds our 2015 request, we believe we can maintain critical competition and stay on track to launch astronauts to the ISS from American spaceports by the end of 2017. All of this is freeing NASA to focus on deep space exploration through the development of the Space Launch System and Orion Crew Vehicle which will take our astronauts farther into space than anyone has ever gone before. The asteroid redirect mission will use SLS and Orion to test our new capabilities in the proving ground of cislunar space before sending a human mission to the red planet. And for all of you purists in the audience, because I know there are some, I know, you know it's cislunar and translunar, but uh, don't be picky. Uh, later this year, um, we will see Exploration Flight Test 1, EFT-1, of Orion atop a Delta IV heavy launch vehicle. NASA is pressing forward with development of SLS and Orion, preparing for a first uncrewed mission to in FY 2018. Finally, as we speak, astronauts aboard the ISS are learning the fundamental lessons necessary to safely execute extended missions deeper into space. Today, we're very fortunate to have one of those astronauts with us. Astronaut Dr. Karen Nyberg was selected for the astronaut program in July of 2000 after serving in various capacities as an engineer at the Johnson Space Center. And I just learned yesterday, uh, Karen started as a, were you a co-op? A co-op at, uh, at JSC. So there's hope, as I told you all this morning, okay? Pick her brain. She made her first of two missions to space as a mission specialist on STS-124 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery in, two, in June of 2008. From May 28th to November 10th, 2013, she served as flight engineer for Expedition 36-37 aboard the ISS. Karen has accumulated more than 180 days in space during these two missions. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of North Dakota and master's and doctor of philosophies in, mass, in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you NASA astronaut, Dr. Karen Nyberg. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be able to be here today. Um, 
Last year, I was extremely priv privileged to live and work for almost six months on the International Space Station. And I can tell you firsthand, it is an incredible facility. We spent every day working on some sort of research, scientific research, which was the goal of the International Space Station. Um, we're doing research up there, finding things out that we just can't in the gravity of Earth. And a lot of that can benefit uh, life on Earth for us, but a lot of it is for extending our reach into the solar system. And the space station is not only being used for science right now. Just as a matter of its existence, it's being used as a technology testbed. Um, we're looking at life support systems, power systems, and those sort of things that we're going to need when we send the human, our human race uh, further away. And low Earth orbit's a great place to do that because we have cargo vehicles coming up that can send spares. We have an access to get home immediately if we need to. But once we go further away, we're not going to have that. So we need this test bed um, to, to study these things and make sure that we're doing it right before we actually go. Um, I'm pretty excited to hear about possibly extending the life of the space station until 2024. I mean, as astronauts, we're really excited about that. For one, that means we get more trips into space. Um, for another, it's just a great opportunity to continue learning more while we have that amazing facility there to do that. Around the nation right now, we're actually working on getting the commercial sector involved. And during our mission, we were pretty fortunate. We had the first demonstration mission of the Orbital Sciences cargo vehicle, Cygnus. And uh, my colleague Luca Parmitano from ESA captured that with the robotic arm, and uh, we brought it on board. And pretty amazing to see that. And we have a SpaceX launch coming up within the week. So we're seeing the commercial sector get involved, and that's going to continue. Um, again, as astronauts, we're pretty excited about the potential of again launching humans from American soil. So we're very excited about everything that's going on and the work that's being done around the nation. And I know everybody here at NASA is extremely excited to um, hear your ideas on how we can go forward with the, the asteroid initiative with the ultimate goal of taking us, the world population, uh, further, further into the solar system. Thank you. our uh, first panel to go ahead and uh, start to get situated. Um, again, you can find out more information about uh, what, uh, what the NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden uh, talked about in the Asteroid Initiative at www.nasa.gov slash asteroid initiative and really appreciate the reminder from astronaut Karen Nyberg that uh, you know, we have uh, uh, an orbital laboratory um, unlike any other where research is happening that uh, can't be done on Earth, uh, 260 miles above our heads right now, and you can find out more information about that research at nasa.gov slash station. Uh, our first panel is uh, here to tell us uh, more about the uh, asteroid redirect mission, and I'd like to introduce our uh, panel's moderator, Michelle Gates, who is Senior Technical Advisor at the Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate here in Washington. Thanks, Trent. Uh, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here with you all to share some updates on our internal mission concept work. It's good to see you all since the last time we got together with the community back in November and the last time in this room actually in June of last year. I'd like to just briefly introduce our esteemed colleagues on the panel today. Uh, the first one to speak will be Lindley Johnson, who has been leading our asteroid observation activity. Brian Muirhead has been leading the development of a robotic mission concept to redirect a small NIA to a stable lunar orbit. Dan Masnick has been leading the development of another concept involving a larger NIA to the same stable lunar orbit, actually a boulder from the NIA. Uh, Jim Ryder has been leading our robotic concept integration team, and Steve Stitch has been leading the crewed mission concept, and Jason Crusan on the end will share with us how this all fits into the broader human spaceflight framework. First slide, please. Thank you. I just wanted to kick off the panel today with a reminder of the preliminary mission objectives that we shared back in the November idea synthesis meeting. This is the set of overall mission objectives against which the 
uh, integration team performed their comparative analysis that you'll see Jim present. Uh, you might remember there's a set of primary objectives involving human exploration, technology demonstration, and NIA observation. And then we had a set of secondary uh, objectives as well. Next slide. Our internal studies uh, that we'll share the results with you today included the reference robotic mission that um, Brian Muirhead will be sharing, another concept involving a larger NIA that Dan Masnick will be speaking with you about, Steve Stitch will talk about the crewed mission, uh, and then the robotic concept integration team's comparative assessment. Next slide. As a result of the, of the work that we'll share with you today, we have consolidated the mission objectives into the set that you see on the screen now. You'll be able to find this on the internet and on the Asteroid Initiative website as well. But you'll see that we have included basic planetary defense demonstration techniques in the um, overall single set of mission objectives as well as targets of opportunity to benefit both um, scientific and uh, partnership interests. And that's all reflected in the um, BAA that Chris, Chris will talk about in the next panel. Next slide. Just a brief summary of all the work we've done since we got together last. You'll see on here the kickoff of the integration team. Uh, Dan Mastic's team actually kicked off that same time frame. We have been working with, through tasking requests, some members of the, internet, of the external community, such as the SBAG and the CAPTEM, on special studies. Uh, continued Spitzer observations. You'll see some work uh, internally in our technology development activity that's to be completed this late spring and summer. Evolving into uh, the input from the BAAs and our mission concept review uh, envisioned for early 2015. So, uh, Lindley, if you'd like to kick, every, if you'd like to get started, that would be great. Sure, Michelle. Thanks. I'm just going to give you a brief uh, status on where we are with the observation uh, segment, observation campaign for finding uh, candidates uh, for the ARM mission. If I could have the next slide. In uh, 2013, uh, this is the uh, year that uh, we reached some milestones with NASA's Near Earth Object Observation Program. Uh, first of all, we uh, exceeded having found 10,000 near Earth objects. Uh, those are asteroids that are in orbits uh, that can approach Earth, uh, Earth's orbit. And we also uh, found more than 1,000 NEOs in a, in a single year. So our capabilities are, are really uh, improving uh, and accelerating in, in this area. Uh, here you see a breakdown of the uh, various uh, search teams and uh, how much uh, of that uh, number that they have found. Of course, our leading search team is Catalina Sky Survey. Now these uh, search teams, uh, the capabilities that uh, we're looking at, uh, they're able to search uh, a thousand uh, square degrees of sky down to a very dim uh, size objects for the techno geeks here down to about 21st uh, magnitude. Uh, so those are the kind of capabilities that we need in the search is being able to search a broad area of the sky uh, uh, very uh, deeply or, di or dimly. Uh, some of our other teams are kind of in a period of transition here because we are enhancing their capabilities. Uh, Linear is converting over to the Space Surveillance Telescope. Uh, Space Watch, although it's no longer doing search, as does follow-up for us, uh, actually finds uh, several objects while it's doing that. And then we reactivated the WISE spacecraft uh, dedicated to NEO search, uh, renamed uh, it uh, NEOWISE, and it just started work uh, in December. Uh, of those 1,000 objects we found in the last year, 11 of them are greater than a kilometer in size. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, rate is down quite a bit from what it has been in previous years, which indicates that uh, we're getting a good handle on that population. And uh, our models show that we found about 97% of one kilometer and larger uh, NEOs now. Uh, 73 of those objects uh, that we found are in orbits uh, that are potentially hazardous to the Earth. Uh, they come uh, close enough to Earth's orbit that we should monitor them. Uh, 36 are in orbits, a uh, subset of those 73. There are in orbits that are reachable uh, by spacecraft uh, using the 
uh, threshold there, a round trip uh, delta V, change in velocity of less than eight kilometers per second. So those are uh, a list of candidates that uh, we uh, then look at as candidates for uh, the ARM mission. Uh, but only 20 uh, uh, of those 20 uh, are uh, available in the next 10 years, which is the time frame we're looking at for this mission. Of that 20, eight are estimated to be uh, small enough uh, to talk about for the reference mission, but uh, we need to be able to characterize those and really understand what the sizes are and what the masses are, and that's a bit of a challenge uh, to do from, from ground-based uh, systems uh, because the access to them is, is somewhat limited. Also, of that 20, uh, nine uh, might make good candidates for the alternate mission, their boulder retrieval, but we've only been able to characterize, uh, uh, only be able to characterize two of those uh, uh, in the future uh, in time for the mission with our ground-based assets. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, in looking at uh, one of the challenges uh, for the observation segment, it is characterization. Uh, we are doing some improvements and enhancements of that capability. Uh, these are the capabilities we largely use to do that. If the object is accessible uh, through our planetary radar, uh, we certainly want to use that. That's the next best thing to having a flyby spacecraft is uh, being able to do uh, radar imaging uh, of the objects. We also use our infrared telescope facility uh, out in Hawaii. Uh, we have uh, both those, uh, uh, all three of those facilities, two radars and the infrared on rapid response when we discover our object. We quickly pass that data uh, to these facilities so that they can take the kind of observations that we need uh, for doing the characterization. So we're increasing the call up uh, rapid response for those capabilities. Uh, and then uh, where it has the opportunity, we also use the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, to determine size and mass uh, of these objects based on the thermal uh, signature. And uh, as uh, Michelle mentioned in her list, uh, we've uh, been using the Spitzer Space Telescope to take a look at one object that is of interest, uh, uh, 2011 MD. Uh, we have those observations uh, and being analyzed now, and we should have some information here in the next month about uh, what we've found out about uh, that object. Um, the uh, observation segment in our work here uh, is uh, not part of the broad area uh, uh, opportunity uh, that we're talking about mostly here, and that's because uh, of the next slide. We have a uh, uh, solicitation uh, opportunity for proposals uh, on a yearly basis uh, as part of NASA's uh, research opportunities in space and earth sciences. The Near Earth Object Observation Program uh, solicits uh, ideas uh, uh, for uh, work uh, in the NEO program every year. Uh, this year, uh, that omnibus uh, solicitation was released in February 18th. Uh, it's a component of our overall solar system observations program, and you can uh, see all the information about the solicitation at that website. Uh, the step one notices are due uh, in just a couple of weeks, and notices of intent uh, proposals are due in June, and then they'll be re peer reviewed later in the uh, uh, summer, and we'll announce uh, new awards. Uh, to the program when the uh, 2015 budget uh, becomes available. And thank you. Thanks, Lindley. Brian? I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the rep what we call the reference mission. This is a body of work that, that NASA has been doing cross-agency for a little over a year now. Next chart, please. So with respect to meeting the primary objectives, the uh, reference mission has been focusing on, on an architecture, a mission design, and a flight system that can deliver the following things. A high performance solar electric propulsion system, much larger than anything that's been flown in space up to this time. Uh, something that would be applicable and expandable to human exploration beyond LEO with a number of, of applications. Uh, the capability to rendezvous with, characterize, operate, and, and operate in close proximity to an asteroid, a near-Earth asteroid. The capability to capture, to control this asteroid and of a size of the order of 10 meters and potentially as much as 1,000 tons, tons, not kilograms. The capability to accommodate a wide range of alternate missions, Dan will talk about that more, including other mission concepts, including missions maybe even to Phobos. In addition to capturing, then we also need to control and return this asteroid to a stable orbit that is crew accessible. 
and we've chosen a near-Earth uh, lunar uh, distant retrograde orbit to do that. And all of this needs to be done in the context of what we call lean development, which we're working to a cost-driven paradigm with acceptable cost risk and technical risk. Next chart. With respect to the secondary objectives, again, the architecture is, addresses all of these. Uh, we've found that the solar electric propulsion system is capable of delivering uh, solutions for uh, what we call ion beam deflection or gravity tractor, which can uh, be part of a, a precise uh, remaneuvering, re, uh, uh, trajectory correction, shall we say, of a um, hazardous asteroid. From a science point of view, visiting or bringing back a, a whole small asteroid represents an opportunity to understand the structure and bulk properties of an asteroid, something that's never been done before. We also don't know what kind of NEO we will actually get for sure, and so there'll be some great science opportunities just associated with the type of asteroid we retrieve. From a, com from a commercial point of view, uh, the solar electric propulsion system has great, a great number of opportunities, both at the component level and maybe at the system level. And there's another unique application of the, using the ion thrusters for potentially changing the uh, orbit of orbital debris and, and helping mitigate that challenge. Uh, we can also demonstrate, fundamentally we will demonstrate the ability to bring back to a crew accessible location hundred, potentially hundreds of tons of material, much more than we're actually able to launch. And finally, we'll make available on our spacecraft if the opportunity presents itself uh, assets that uh, partners, commercial or international, could take advantage of. Next chart, please. This is the basic mission overview. Very quickly, uh, we can launch on any of four launch vehicles from the Atlas, Falcon, Delta IV, or SLS. Uh, depending on which one, we either go direct or we do a, a, a spiral out. Uh, then we fly to the asteroid, we rendezvous with the asteroid, and I'll describe that a little bit more. We capture it, and then we maneuver it back to, uh, we adjust its trajectory slightly in order to align it for an, uh, lunar orbit, a lunar gravity assist, and then we, we sling it into a distant retrograde orbit. Next chart. All of that is on the order of a five-year cycle. And again, the it's important to recognize that what we're doing is just slightly adjusting the, the natural trajectory or orbit, I should say, of the body in order to align it with the moon and allow us to do that gravity assist. Here's a set of five asteroids that Lindley's uh, team has, has found for us. First one is what we call 2009 BD. We've determined this is a valid target. This is one that we can bring back. We can put into orbit with our existing system. Uh, it's a slow rotator, and it can be brought back in the time frame in the uh, late 2023 or early 2024. Lindley mentioned 2011 MD, which may be a potential uh, target, both of which have been evaluated by Spitzer, and uh, we're awaiting the, uh, the final results on 2011 MD. There's other asteroids in the future, and we're expecting the NEO program to find many more targets for us, and we're uh, constantly, we're looking on a daily basis. Next chart. This, is, this shows how the launch date changes as a function of the mass of the target. So in this case, we drew a line for 2009 BD at about 145 tons. And you can see that we can launch in June of 2019 on any of these four launch vehicles and out as late as December of 2020 with our higher performance heavy lift launch vehicle. So it gives us some flexibility on the, on the launch window. Next chart. Uh, just very quickly, from a uh, planetary defense demonstration point of view, uh, there's a couple of techniques that we can use, ion beam or gravity tractor. We've focused on uh, what the capabilities of that can present in terms of changing the velocity of, the, uh, of a small asteroid. And it turns out we can, very, we can make quite a substantial change in the order of a millimeter per second very quickly uh, with this technique for a small body. And Dan will talk more about what that means for a much larger body. Next chart. With respect to the spacecraft, what we call the asteroid redirect vehicle, we've, in order to develop a system that we think is uh, very cost, uh, very, can be implemented in a lean fashion, it meets our cost constraint, we've uh, chosen a modular design where we have a capture system, a mission module, a set module, and all sitting on top of a launch vehicle adapter. Uh, and each of these can be developed in parallel and the integration of which is, we believe, is relatively straightforward with the interfaces that we've designed. So the capture system is a unique system, and I'll describe that. The mission module is very high heritage. It's built on, on the SMAP MSL uh, experience. And the SEP module is, uh, uses the STMD technologies associated with high power solar electric propulsion and hall thrusters. Next chart. 
This is just shows the configurations of the vehicles in the deployed state. Next chart. Now, very quickly, you know, why did we end up with a bag? Uh, the thinking here is that asteroids, large asteroids are rubble piles. We believe, therefore, it's highly likely that a small asteroid will also be a rubble pile. So we've chosen this approach, which is, accommodates a potential variety of sizes and strengths associated with these bodies, and the bag basically will protect us and the vehicle and the crew from something that may not be as strong as uh, we anticipated. Well, we've also adopted a strategy where we're looking primarily at slow rotators. We had looked at fast rotators. Uh, that represents a, a more complex problem, but in the interest of, of uh, cost control and simplicity, we've chosen to eliminate maybe 25% of the potential targets. But so far, our two primary targets are slow rotators. Next chart. This is the basic uh, sequence of events associated with the rendezvous and proximity operations. We use our uh, uh, narrow angle camera to do the rendezvous. Uh, the final using optical uh, techniques. Uh, then we characterize with that. Then as we approach, we start using our th uh, 3D LIDAR, which uh, helps us characterize the, the shape, the size, the rotation. And then we initiate what we call the pre-capture activity where we deploy our airbag, we do our approach. All of this now under closed loop control associated with the, uh, the LIDAR system. We then envelop the asteroid, and in fact, we think of it as docking. We actually will fly the spacecraft to the surface of the asteroid and dock it. And at that point, we close the bag, and we now have the bag and the spacecraft integrated, and then we do our final characterization of what the mass properties are. We spin down the asteroid, and now we're ready to begin the, the flight back to Earth, or back to the moon, back to cislunar space, shall I say. Next chart. The, um, all of this, the uh, Sensing is, is critical to the implementation of this strategy. Uh, we've uh, adopted a strategy where we're using kind of the minimum sensor suite uh, that is the simplest suite, uh, set of, simplest set of instruments we think that can do, accomplish this job. So we've baselined a narrow angle camera, two narrow angle cameras that again do the rendezvous and initial characterization, a 3D scanning LIDAR with a relatively large field of view because we're going to be approaching this asteroid and controlling th with that device. And then we have some wide angle cameras uh, that provide engineering information and, and, and public outreach information. Uh, we've also included a near-infrared uh, spectrometer, which will help give us composition of the asteroid. All of those are integrated into the assembly, as you see in the figure, on top of the, uh, as part of the capture system and um, as part of the overall system. So overall, uh, we've got a, a fundamental concept we think meets the primary and secondary objectives that NASA has set for us and uh, does that within the cost constraint that, uh, that we've been working to. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Um, my name is Dan Masnick. I'm from NASA Langley again. And um, I just first of all want to say I've had the honor over the past um, six months to, uh, uh, to lead a very capable team um, and looking at this, this mission concept um, cl in close collaboration with Goddard as well as the other NASA centers and some uh, academic uh, uh, universities. So the next chart, please. So in a, in a nutshell, um, you know, the, this, this option, what we call the robotic boulder capture option, um, takes a different tack on the asteroid redirect mission. It says, let's go out to a large near-Earth asteroid um, and demonstrate planetary defense technique or techniques at that asteroid on a, on a relevant size object um, from, a, from an impact hazard, and then return a boulder from the surface of that object of that asteroid um, back to cislunar space. And as part of that mission, mature some of the key technologies and operations um, that are required for future space operations, including uh, uh, missions in a human class, human Mars class um, mission environment. For example, um, missions to Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars. So the next, if we can queue up the video, I'm gonna start off by um, introducing a video here that will show the basic portions of the mission. If we could have the video, please. There we go. Ooh, the lights are down. Um, so again, the asteroid redirect vehicle, which is in large, largely the same um, in terms of the SEP and the mission module, we visit a large near-Earth asteroid, and we can deploy the, uh, the capture system, and I'll talk a little bit more about the different options that we've looked at. Uh, we can deploy that in route or at arrival and exercise the uh, robotic capability. We then survey the asteroid with a series of one kilometer flybys. And then we begin boulder collection operations, uh, and that includes a set of dry runs 
to make sure the systems, the terrain relative navigation is working properly. Um, and then we descend to the surface and uh, you, you're, again, you have to remember we're in a microgravity environment. So as the spacecraft comes to the surface, this actually the depiction right now that you're seeing is in real time around a, a two to 300 meter uh, large asteroid. We then contact the surface and um, attenuate the loads with what we call the capture arms. They're akin to landing legs, but in essence, like Brian said, it's more like docking. Um, and that was also depicted in real time. The boulder collection process takes approximately 30 minutes, and, and that's obviously sped up. So in this, in this scene, you see the ascent with a three meter boulder. And again, uh, this is depicted in real time. Everything happens very slowly. There are, uh, the, the accelerations are, uh, the environment, the microgravity environment is, uh, is very low, about 10 micro -g's on, a, on an asteroid like Itakawa. And then uh, the ascent from the surface is complete. And then what happens is we transition into uh, planetary defense demonstration mode. And in this case, we, we focused on an enhanced gravity tractor concept where we use the mass of the boulder to augment the spacecraft which we think has a lot of applicability to, an, uh, to a real mission. And then we enter into a, a halo orbit that maintains a safe distance from the asteroid. And we can, we can um, demonstrate a deflection in about 60 days of interaction or as much as 180 days waiting for the, the proper alignment for doing the, um, uh, the trajectory analysis. After that, the asteroid uh, redirect vehicle and the boulder return to the stable lunar orbit where similar to the, uh, the small asteroid capture option, um, the crew can, can visit it for sampling. Now, we're, we're going after a coherent boulder, so as Brian talked about, we don't have the, the need to encapsulate it. Um, we've got multiple boulder attempts. We've got up to five attempts at three different sites um, and release capability. And what we did is we looked at a series of different proximity operations and capture systems. Um, including a, a three degree of freedom space frame, which is what you saw there in the animation. But we've also looked at seven degree of freedom robotic arms with, uh, with grippers. In, in particular, we've been looking at the JPL microspine um, concept for actually uh, gripping onto the boulder, and I'll show that in a second. And they all, we also have a hybrid option that uses the seven DOF arms for the actual boulder collection, but uses the space frame uh, contact arms for attenuating the loads and, and being able to provide a mechanical push off. Um, next, please. So as Brian mentioned, it's a modular approach to the, the asteroid redirect robotic mission. Um, because we have a lot more operations at the, uh, the surface of the asteroid, um, we're adopting a kind of a payload module approach that would bring all the sensors and the robotic uh, systems together. They can be integrated and functionally test and then integrated with the, uh, the mission module and the SEP. What this also allows us to do is have a, a SEP mission module bus that can be used for a, a multitude of future missions. So there's a lot of extensibility uh, aspects that are that are enabled there. So next, please. Um, this has a little more details of the the hybrid option, and you can see in the bottom right is is a demonstration of the microspine microspine um, uh, grippers to actually reach out and pick up a, a boulder in a test facility, uh, and and you can see that operation going on from different angles. Um, and, and what it enables to do is it's a series of very small spines that can, can grab any coherent surface, uh, whether it's curved or flat. Um, and then we can also use the, uh, the contact arms as, as a containment system for the boulder uh, and then use the robotic manipulators if we want to do further testing or uh, taking pictures of the boulder on the way back to facilitate crude operations. So we think that this hybrid capture system optimizes the functionality for the mission and it has, again, a multitude of extensibility aspects from satellite servicing to um, interaction with Phobos Deimos if we, if we go to the Martian moons on a path to the Mars surface. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of options there that are enabled. Next, please. So just a quick note about boulder mass and size and density. Um, asteroids are a variety of different uh, compositions from metallic to stony to carbonaceous. We would, and, and the, the mass of that is shown on the left there between one and 50 tons, but you can see how that parlays into a size. A, a much a lower density carbonaceous brings back a, a larger boulder. Um, in comparison, you can see how that compares to 
uh, the ISS over a football field at the bottom, and the parent body is a 100-meter asteroid, which is about a million tons, uh, are far too much to uh, contemplate returning the entire thing. But it gives you an idea of the different scales. And again, the observed size, we think, is the key characteristic uh, of the object return that the public sees. So from a mass standpoint, we're not, we're not going to get out there and weigh it, um, but the size of the, the amount of material uh, can, be, can be substantial even for this boulder collection uh, option. Next, please. To give you an idea of some of the target, uh, uh, candidate target asteroids that we're talking about, we have four that we have well characterized either with existing uh, previous precursor mission, which is Itakawa. Um, Bennu and 1999 J JU-3 will both have robotic missions that, provide, that could provide precursors before we launch. And then 2008 EV-5, which actually has the most mass return, um, is, is well characterized with radar. The um, Itakau is a stony asteroid, and Bennu, uh, JU-3, and EB-5 are all carbonaceous, and in particular, volatile-rich and water-rich carbonaceous objects, which is an important characteristic uh, in terms of the benefits for science and, and resources. Um, and, and the other thing to say is when we, when we go to one of these large asteroids, we have the ability to choose the boulder that we want to return. So based on programmatic constraints, return dates, um, there are potentially a multitude of boulders that we can choose from. Next, please. So sensor selection, um, basically we have a, a, a sensor suite that enables uh, redundancy and the ability to uh, characterize thousands of boulders potentially on the surface of the object. It also has uh, a lot of public engagement and science um, capabilities. And then we, we do not have ground ruled in a penetrating, ground penetrating radar system, but that would be an ideal mission of opportunity to help gain more understanding of the subsurface and uh, the, the, the asteroid we're visiting in general. Next, please. So planetary defense demonstration, um, going to a large near-Earth asteroid allows us to be able to do a kinetic impactor as well as these other slow push techniques. Um, our focus was, again, on this enhanced gravity tractor, um, but these other, these other types of planetary defense demonstrations could be uh, uh, performed as well. And so finally, next slide, please. So just in some closing remarks, and I haven't had a whole lot of time to introduce this. Um, there are some backup materials that are going to be published on the, on the website that folks can look through with more details. But this, the Boulder Caption option addresses a, um, the needs of a broad set of stakeholders um, from Mars forward exploration, science, uh, resources, commercial and international opportunities, and of course, a planetary defense on a hazardous size NIA. So with that, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Ryder. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the integration activities that we've had um, over for the robotic concepts. Um, next chart, please. Uh, so the, the integration team was formed. Uh, we had a kickoff in October. The idea, the purpose was to assess the robotic concepts and provide, um, provide a recommended, recommended path forward, um, incorporating the results from the RFI uh, responses uh, last fall. Uh, the membership of this was kind of a twofold membership. Uh, we had the representatives from each of these teams. I was the chair. Uh, but we also brought in additional members from across the agency to make sure we had a broad perspective, you know, within, within NASA for, for uh, conducting this. So it was kind of a twofold of we're an integration activity, but also an uh, evaluation activity. Um, so to help us with that, we ended up using six special study advisory teams. I'll talk about each of those um, in another chart. Um, and we gave a status in December and our result provided our findings in February. And a lot of those fed into the discussions of what we want to do with this BA and, and how we go forward. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, so Michelle showed the preliminary objectives that we were given, from mission objectives we were given. Um, we converted those into figures of merit as shown on this chart. So we talked in terms of cost, schedule, uh, meeting the primary objectives, meeting the secondary objectives, uh, safety and mission success, and sustainability. And within those, we broke those down uh, for each of the primary objectives. Of course, as, as we've said, the, 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 pri the most primary objective is the support for human exploration. How does it fit into our long-term strategy? And with that, the technology demonstrations of those items uh, that, that will allow us to, to, deep, to explore deep space. And then um, enhancing our observation campaign from secondaries, as we've talked, the planetary defense, science, commercial and resource use, and partnership opportunities. How does each of these concepts uh, 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 compare in, in, the, in meeting these objectives? 
Uh, from safety and mission of success, while it's a robotic mission, when we come back to cislunar space and meet with the crewed mission, the, the designs that we have can affect crew safety, and uh, we need to evaluate the mission success and technical risks. And finally, from a sustainability standpoint, we looked at um, stakeholder interests and mission extensibility. Uh, next chart, please. We, um, just as a high-level comparison, as, as both Brian and, and, and Dan talked, from a, uh, a mission from a spacecraft architecture standpoint, the set module is very modular, and the set module itself should be nearly identical depending on the mission, which is really the intent of what we're trying to do. The, uh, what we call the mission module or, um, can be largely the same. It can be the same architecture, we believe, and, and can kind of create a, a, a spacecraft bus with a payload interface. Uh, is, is, and so the goal for us has been, can we make it look so that it is that bus, so it's a multi-use vehicle as, as we evolve it. Um, and so the, the primary distinction between the options, naturally the, the, op, the proximity operations and how we operate near the um, asteroid, but, also, but then it the, becomes a capture system. And so many of the risks uh, in development are the same, and, and we can proceed in parallel as we evaluate our concepts. Next chart, please. Um, just at a very high level uh, on size comparisons, um, we looked at the, the comparing the, the points of departure and, and you can kind of look at it from how big the spacecraft is relative to the person, relative to um, varying size um, boulders or asteroids. Um, and on the, what we can receive, uh, retrieve from an Itakawa point of departure for, um, for the um, boulder uh, concept, a uh, boulder capture concept, is on the order of two, three meters. Um, 2009 BD ends up being a little bit smaller asteroid in the range of, of, act, of asteroids that we might capture on a redirect. So it's probably four meters or, or, or around there or less. Um, and so, but it, but it led us to a discussion of, well, how big is big enough? And, and we really felt like about two meters from a variety of standpoints, about two meters and above is something we can, uh, that's viable for our missions. Next chart, please. We also tried to understand the trade space that we had and characterize it in terms of our swim lanes of what, what's the mission we tried to accomplish, the technology, capture system design, uh, what type of planetary defense demo we might we have, and whether we have payloads for science and commercial use. Um, we show on there in the red and the blue the points of departure for which we evaluated, but we also tried to show the trade space and, and look at where from the RFI responses that we received. So at a high level, um, the other two options from a mission standpoint that we're not talking about is you could actually visit both. We, there is a way that you could visit a large and a small, uh, but it's not really one that meets our primary objectives very well. So that one we really didn't look at. We looked for a while at, at a Mars moon option for this. It's, it has attractive features and we'll talk a bit more about how that fits in, but not for our first mission is where we got to. From a technology standpoint, we're pushing technology that's part of our primary objectives for how it meets exploration, but you could um, craft this uh, to back away from those technology demonstrations. For purposes of our study, we didn't look at that, but you'll see as part of this BAA, we're kind of are investigating it a little bit more. Uh, the capture system can any, and we got a lot of these responses last time. Um, anywhere from an inflatable bag to um, deployable booms, the manipulator types options, and and even dual spacecraft. So you can see where we focused, um, and uh, our activities, and and in our follow-on call, we want to focus a little bit more to help fill in our trade space. Uh, planetary defense demo, you could have no demo. Um, both our concepts are are are. Uh, we're referencing or, or including in our points of departure a slow push type system, um, and kinetic impactors are ones that are options um, that are out there. Uh, from a science and commercial payload, we started with no dedicated science or payload, but as part of this call, what we're looking for is whether there's targets of opportunity that we can pursue, and as Brian talked about, is we're, we're creating spaces in the vehicles to, to potentially, and, and in the and in the launch vehicles to potentially um, take advantage of that, and we're looking forward to the feedback to see how well that fits into our plans. Next chart, please. Um, we've looked through mission profile comparison for both the points of departure and other asteroids. And just to make sure that we tally up, that we understand the basically how long this would take, it, does it fit within our capacity for the vehicle? And, and there's puts and takes. This is uh, the, the small asteroid of 2009 BD. Because it's a little bit smaller, than, it tends to get back sooner. It takes a little bit less uh, xenon than, than it would require for, for another asteroid. Uh, larger one. And from the Itakawa, it tends to be a little bit harder for us to reach. Um, when you look at the planetary defense demo, when you're do, doing that on a small one, you can demonstrate uh, on a small one very quickly in a matter of hours, whereas 
On uh, a larger one, it, it can be, if you want to demonstrate all the way to not just techniques, but showing some measurable um, effect, then it takes a long time. Um, so and it, it, these all depend, but, but basically we've looked at a series of cases and they all fit within this basic um, spacecraft that we've, uh, that we've specified. Next chart. Uh, from the special study teams, as I said, we had six teams. Um, the, I'll just very quickly go through what, they, what we've learned from them. There's an automated rendezvous and docking commonality team. Um, Heather Hinkle led that. It was a multi-center NASA team. And she's going to talk a bit more about those results because we fed them into this RF. This, this BAA. And they've identified, with, through that we identified a viable uh, common AR&D sensor suite that we think is applicable to both concepts and the crewed mission. Uh, there is a, a curation and planning team for extraterrestrial materials, CAPTEM, it's a joint university and NASA team where they gave, provided us 11 findings relative to guiding our EVA objectives for the crewed mission, which also supported our assessment of the robotic concepts. Uh, we had, um, because the, it was the proximity operations and the capture system was the primary distinction in terms of technical risks of these. We formed a peer review team for that within NASA, and, and they provided overall technical and schedule risk assessments for the concepts. We had a, a small team that, that assessed, did a sanity check on the cost basis of estimate and provide, for each concept and provided their findings. Um, we um, reached out to the Small Bodies Assessment Group, formed a special ac action team, and they provided us information on the physical nature of the small asteroids and boulders, as, as both Dan and, and Brian talked about, a key part of uh, formulating this mission is understanding those physical characteristics. And we have forward work with them uh, to provide science considerations as, as we move to the next phase. And we enlisted some planetary defense experts, and they, which provided perspectives related to the potential for our armed planetary defense techniques demonstrations. Next chart, please. Uh, we folded that into a risk assessment we, um, that we developed over the last few months. 104 risks we captured. 19 of them, we focused down to 19 key ones we to help contrast the missions. Um, we assessed the risks uh, before and after mitigation and, and, uh, and um, showed, highlighted some of the key risks for both um, small asteroid and robotic ca boulder capture missions, as well as key common risks. We use these. Um, First to identify that we didn't have showstoppers, and then also to say, uh, to focus on what should be the next step, next phase for our activities. Uh, next chart. Uh, we looked at distinctions between the, uh, on the secondary objectives and planetary defense, science extensibility. I um, will provide this for, for you for, for um, look at, but it's a, it's a contrast as we've talked about. Um, basically a, a small one, you can, you can show demonstration techniques uh, much more quickly for planetary defense, but for it's more relevant on a, on a larger one. Um, next chart, please. And then uh, we summarize those into key distinguishing characteristics, uh, discuss those with our agency leadership in, age, in, in February, and, and concluded that for us, what we would like to do is, is take the next step, um, work on the risk mitigation activities over the next several months, obtain inputs from industry through this BAA process, and then um, go through another round as, as we're getting closer to an MCR and, and use, use the input from the community to help us on the down select. And next chart. And then finally what we did is we went back through the, um, the findings from the workshop and made sure that we incorporated those into our plans. Uh, and looked at those and evaluated, you know, and so the check marks say that we've gone through those and evaluated which ones of those we'd incorporate into gain some additional feedback on this BAA, which is highlighted in green on this chart and the next chart. And so with that, we were ready to move forward and we're looking forward to this, um, through this next phase of getting the input back from our community through this BAA. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, first of all, it's great, great to be here this afternoon, uh, four months after our a synthesis workshop down in Houston at the Lunar Planetary Institute. Um, I've been working on the uh, crewed mission segment for over a year now with the multi-center team. Uh, of course, we're leading it out of JSC, and I've really had the uh, an honorable to lead that whole team. We have representatives from uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, Glenn Research Center, Kennedy Space Search, Kennedy Space Center, um, Goddard Space Center, and Langley. So we've kind of got a team all across, crawl across the agency. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So you've heard some pretty incredible robotic missions that uh, both Dan and, and Brian Muirhead have talked about. I think the culmination of those missions will be in the 2024 timeframe when we send our astronauts beyond low Earth orbit once again in the Orion vehicle to um, obtain samples 
uh, from the asteroid, whether it be the boulder or the larger asteroid, uh, by doing two spacewalks in, in this uh, distant retrograde orbit, will have gone further in space, 71,000 kilometers from the moon than ever before. And if you think about our spacewalking experience uh, on a planetary surface or really beyond low Earth orbit, we really just have a handful of spacewalks. So if you think about how this feeds forward to Mars, uh, we'll really be pushing the boundaries and expanding that capability in this region of the Proving Ground, as Charlie said earlier, and Jason will talk a little bit about this cislunar space region. So we see this as kind of the first of a series of missions we'll fly in cislunar space. But this will be a very bold mission, uh, using Orion as both the transport vehicle to get the crew out to cislunar space, um, also as the living quarters, and also as an airlock all in one. So when I look back at my flight director days from shuttle, this is a pretty bold mission that we're talking about executing. Next slide, please. So I'm going to sort of focus in three areas uh, since uh, what we talked about back in November. Uh, really, I'm going to talk about how this mission builds capabilities for the future. I'm going to share a little bit about the updates as to, as to what we've done uh, since then and the areas we focused on. And then we're going to kind of hand it over to Jason and let him talk about the future of exploration. But if you look at kind of what we're building here on, on the Asteroid Redirect Mission, the crewed segment, we really are building the building blocks. We're taking the capabilities we're working on today within the agency, uh, things like the Orion vehicle, docking systems, the EVA systems. We're putting those together in a mission in, in a way that provides a compelling location for an early Orion mission, but also builds forward to Mars. If you kind of start at the bottom, you see the Orion vehicle. That's going to be the core a transportation leg for all deep space missions. So we see this as a very early test flight. If you think about missions to Mars that take a long time, this is an area that we're nine or 10 days from the Earth. If you think about docking systems, we're going to need docking systems as we evolve to missions to Mars and, and other locations. So that's a fundamental building block. And then if you think about spacewalking and EVA, we're building the system today, starting in advanced exploration systems, the primary life support systems and the suits, that then feed forward to Mars. So that's a very important uh, part of, of the mission. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about solar electric propulsion, which is a very fundamental building block for deploying cargo to Mars someday or deploying land lander systems and things like that. So we kind of see what we're doing with the mission is we're taking things that we're working on already today, hardware that's already in development, we put them together in this mission, and then that feeds forward to Mars. Next chart. So what I'll talk about is uh, the different segments of the mission and the, 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 the uh, advances that we've made since back in November. Uh, the first is in the, the rendezvous and trajectory area. We've really done uh, three things. One, we've come up with a common, what we think is a common approach to rendezvous and docking that we can share between what's used on Orion and then what we'll use on the robotic spacecraft. And, and Heather will talk more about that as it relates to the BAA in the second panel. So. Uh, what we're looking at there is a way to save cost and sort of feed forward to a rendezvous sensor system that can be used multiple times in deep space. On the right, you see this uh, trajectory sl slide. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand how we'll go rendezvous and approach the spacecraft, uh, the robotic spacecraft in cislunar space with Orion. We've been looking at how we would execute the transition from the insertion into the distant retrograde orbit, and then how we would move our, uh, Orion in close to the spacecraft. We're understanding this region of space, which we've never really executed rendezvous and prox ops in. And so we're learning that it's a pretty simple region to work in. Uh, the uh, maneuvers are very straightforward, and you get what's called linear motion as opposed to in low Earth orbit or low lunar orbit, where you have uh, some gravity effects of the, the primary body. And so we think we can kind of set the rendezvous approach up to where we'll have the sun at the crew's back, and we can fly on in, and we'll have lots of uh, opportunities to rendezvous there, and so we're working on the details of that. At the bottom, you can see the Storm DTO, which just represents one of the sensor technologies which uh, we've flown on shuttle, and we see that kind of technology as feeding forward to, uh, to the uh, deep, deep space missions. And then also the trajectory techniques at the bottom, I've talked about this in a lot of detail at various forums, but again, we see this as a learning ground for those future missions to Mars. We have a, a swing by the moon, both on the outbound phase and uh, on the inbound phase to execute a lunar gravity cyst at about 100 kilometers, and then understanding how to work and operate in cislunar space. The navigation techniques, all these trajectory techniques really do feed forward to Mars. And so we're doing it in a region of space where we can come back in the um, 9 to 11 day region, which is a little further than we do today on space station. Next slide. 
So in terms of docking systems, we are, again are leveraging uh, capabilities we're building within HEO. The space station program ha is building a docking capability for commercial crew. So we're leveraging that system. They're, they're building what's called a block one system. It's going to go in two locations on space station, on the forward facing port and on the upward or zenith port uh, on, uh, on node two. And so we're going to evolve that capability and we've already started to work on that this year with the space station program. In FY14, we've initiated a study to take that block one and look at upgrading that for deep space uh, in terms of voltages and avionics, uh, how we would handle the deep space environment, the, uh, the environment in the cislunar space in this distant retrograde orbit is very much colder than the, the LEO environment, how we would reduce the mass, obviously uh, the mass penalties for going into the distant ret retrograde orbit and beyond are, are much harsher than in the LEO environment. And then is there a way we can go work on this system and, and package it even better? So we've started that work. And this is a unique in this mission how we're leveraging uh, investments made by one program into another program. So here you're talking about space station working with Orion and then also uh, our asteroid redirect mission. Next slide. So we've spent a lot of time working on the uh, primary life support system. This is a project uh, that Jason has in advanced exploration systems. So we, uh, we are into uh, variable oxygen regulator testing at White Sands. We built a PLUS a prototype 2.0 in FY13. We're into testing of that in the lab at JSC. That work involves integrated metabolic testing, uh, functional testing. You can see the mannequin over to the, the right where we can put a bunch of sensors in and understand the airflow and the CO2 scrubbing capability of this PLUS. Uh, the primary life support system is a big upgrade. The PLUS we fly today on space station is 40-year-old technology, and so we see this as an infusion path to have a new life support system that we could fly perhaps uh, on any kind of exploration mission, even feeding forward to Mars, and then uh, also on the asteroid redirect mission. And it would be agnostic of the suit, whether it be this planetary suit that we show in the, the lower right, or the mitophyte ACES suit, or uh, other kinds of suits. Next slide. We've also spent a lot of time uh, working out the details of how we'll execute the two um, EVAs in the neutral buoyancy lab. In February, we had a, a pretty significant test uh, first time we've had two crew members in the neutral buoyancy lab with the modified ACES suit. You can see the pictures uh, on the slide. Uh, we have uh, purchased some new suits which have some en enhancements to try to enhance mobility. We've changed the bias position in the arms and we've added some, some bearings in the arms to provide a little bit more mobility. And we've also added EMU boots to the suit and a capability to actually uh, ingress a portable foot restraint which is necessary for the mission. And so we did a series of, uh, of two tests in February with uh, Two experienced crew members, uh, Dan Burbank and Rex Walheim, both have flown on station and on shuttle. And so we're working through that capability. We'll go into a, a series of tests uh, in April next month and start to work on the second part of the mission. The test in February really focused on the, the first part of the, the spacewalk, um, egressing Orion, uh, setting up the work site, setting up the translation pole. Now we'll work on a lot more of the techniques to actually uh, interact with the bag and cut through the bag in, in April. And then finally, we have a uh, next slide, please. So we're, uh, we're looking at uh, ways to take the spacecraft that, that you've heard about and evolve that for a Mars capability. A lot of the Mars studies today show that you have one monolithic SEP system of a megawatt taking hard hardware out to Mars. What we're looking at is on the lower right where you break that spacecraft up into maybe 100 to 250 kilowatt type spacecraft and you preposition hardware at Mars, and, and so what that does is it enables uh, a different class of missions. You don't have to wait for one big monolithic spacecraft. You can kind of pre-position elements uh, as you go. And the next slide sort of shows a notional Phobos mission that we would use as a building block from ARM. Uh, we would pre-position a Phobos habitat and return propellant in the uh, Mars orbit system, uh, and that sort of enables a Phobos or Deimos landing mission. We would fly the crew on a traditional trajectory. That would take seven to nine months. We can use SEP to take three or four years to preposition uh, these assets out at Mars and then use those to return the crew. And then we'd spend 16 months in the Mars system, and then we could potentially execute a, uh, a Phobos-type mission with the habitat. So this is something we're looking at, but we sort of see the uh, asteroid redirect vehicle feeding very much forward into this kind of sequence for a, a Phobos mission. And then finally, our last slide. So this is the way we see the capabilities feeding forward. So today on station, we have deep space habitat capability. 
We're testing high reliability life support, which we need for Mars. Uh, then with the asteroid redirect, we add a lot of additional exploration capabilities. We add Orion. We add the experience with deep space navigation and docking and guidance and control. We add exploration EVA. Then we uh, add the solar electric propulsion capability. And you can see that builds a set of capabilities needed for the ultimate goal, which is on the upper right, a Mars short surface stay or long surface stay. And then later on, we developed the final capabilities, ISRU and power surface systems, a surface habitat, and EDL capabilities to enable the Mars landing, as Charlie talked about in his opening remarks. So we see the asteroid mission as a pretty key component of going from where we're at today on station, which is very complementary to the mission, building these next capabilities, and then moving forward in exploration. Thanks, Dave. Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Crusan. I'm going to back up a little bit and give you a, a little bigger picture of how what you've heard today kind of fits into our overall human spaceflight architecture. So if we go to the first chart, um, what, what you're seeing here is a, pictation, a picture of um, how, how we move from today's capabilities as we're kind of working on the fundamentals at ISS and mastering those fundamentals. Um, you see other capabilities are our advancement of commercial cargo and crew to low Earth orbit. Um, and over time, now you're seeing how that we move from this Earth-reliant phase, which has relatively short durations in order to get back to Earth, moving to this proving ground phase. As Steve described, the, the nine to 11 day phase allows us to start testing our human space flight systems and capabilities in this proving ground on a pathway to move out to uh, Mars, to, to the, what we're kind of, we characterize here as more this Earth independent phase. And you think about the, this in time duration of it, it takes for the crew to get home. Um, and so it's really critical in this proving ground phase that we work on the, uh, these capabilities. So I'm going to walk through um, this at a high level and give you some more details on that. So the next slide. So this is a chart that many have seen over the years that we've used. It's our capability-driven framework. Um, I won't spend a lot of time explaining it, but at the, at the basis of this ex uh, slide shows as capabilities advance, new missions or mission classes open up. So what we're working on here with the asteroid mission is advancing critical uh, stepping stones of those capabilities to start working on in-space propulsion, the SLS and Orion capabilities, the EVA capabilities, and we're actually being able to extend our duration of human spaceflight into deep space. And we're, we're kind of walking up these stepping stones on our way to the ability to have humans into the solar system and onto the surface of Mars. Um, on the next page, um, one of the things that we always talk about technical capabilities, but there's other some guiding principles that we have to consider at the same time. Um, it's not just building the right technical capabilities, but we have to be bounded by some realistic expectations or principles within human spaceflight. Um, you'll see them listed here. Obviously, we're working within our budget with our modest increases that we have today. We're, we're looking at how do we apply high technology readiness level solutions while still maintaining a portfolio of investments for the future that we need as well. Here you saw us tying together relatively high technology readiness level technologies into a mission application that's uh, pretty compelling for us to, to start buying down some more risk towards Mars. Um, we want this near-term mission opportunities, a, a constant cadence. Um, we can't just plan to build for 15 years of systems and go launch it one day. We need to be able to figure out how do we buy down that risk over time but through incremental uh, reasonable steps uh, and have that near-term mission uh, cadence to do that. Uh, we need to do this not alone. We need to work with our U.S. commercial business and expand the lessons that we've learned with uh, commercial cargo and crew and our overall logistics chain that we've had experience with there. But how do we expand that into even further markets? Um, we need to stop throwing away hardware is really the point of number five. How do you, how do, you do multi-use evolvable space infrastructure? How do you use evolvable capabilities? Um, let's not build the same sensor for uh, the same sensor capability on multiple vehicles. Let's build one integrated sensor capability and use it across. Let's build one um, set of elements and evolve that element over time to, to the capabilities that we need today. And going back to our, the last principle here, we have a strong partnership relationship with uh, all of our ISS partners and through our global exploration roadmap, the rest of the space community, global space community. And we are then will be leveraging them and working with them as true partners as we go forward with this. So next slide. 
So here's a simple, simple way to take a look at it. As we move from this Earth to Morallant phase, there are sequences of missions where ARM, as Charlie described, is one of those key linchpins, but there's, it, is, it is not everything. There are multiple things that we need to do in this proving ground on our way towards being Earth independent and ready for Mars. Um, so we go on to the next page. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview here. This is our global exploration roadmap. This is not a NASA slide. This is a slide actually developed by the global community of space agencies. And what we're looking at here is the, starting with the principles of today, our strong international partnership, building upon that uh, partnership, extending the life of station to allow us to maximize the utilization of station both for, um, for research purposes and commercial utilization, but also our risk reduction for exploration. Leveraging that capability, starting to think about, and as we are here today, how do robotics missions and human spaceflight missions work together? Not just at NASA, but in the global sense. Um, you saw uh, some of our key measurements um, before on which asteroids and which boulders you want to go contact. It wasn't just NASA missions to these asteroids. We are coupling the global community into these measurements on how do we work uh, scientific missions along with human spaceflight. Um, these are kind of our core principles then leading into sending humans beyond low Earth orbit and, and working in this proving ground on our way to Mars. So next slide. So people ask a lot of times, okay, what, what pathways are out there for us? I mean, today we're mastering those fundamentals with station, we're, bu we're building that high reliable life support system, lowering mass of those systems. We're uh, obviously bringing uh, SLS and Orion as our deep space transportation leg uh, online uh, for advancing that. We have a high EVA rate um, when we did assembly a station, but we really need to figure out what is the EVA uh, dynamics as we go into exploration, as Steve uh, uh, talked about. Autonomous rendezvous and docking. Um, we're still going to have uh, large-scale docking in these deep uh, orbits that we need to be able to do. How do we advance that into common docking systems? So we're building on this high kind of fundamental heritage that we have, and now we're starting to push those boundaries from an operational perspective, getting into the deep space operations, trajectories, uh, the radiation environment, the environments that our crews will work in. Um, how do you do true robotic and human mission vehicle interactions and those complicated um, maneuvers that these spacecraft will have to do to work together um, while still working on that advanced in-space propulsion and large object maneuvering. Um, even, even going further on our object maneuvering, if you look at maneuvering pieces of an asteroid or an asteroid itself, that stack size, the masses that you saw there, are similar to the masses that we'll have to manipulate in, uh, as on our pathway to sending humans to Mars. So this uh, will give us critical risk reduction there. Um, and then this opens up pathways through Mars, through Mars moons, uh, working with our international partners in cislunar space as they proceed to international or, pen or potentially even commercial options for the moon uh, working together. So these are the critical elements that we're building on today to open up all these pathways as we go uh, into the future. Next slide. So a little more specifics about what we're here for today talking about. This builds upon Steve's chart that you saw a little bit earlier. You have the core building blocks of what the ARM mission brings to the table. There's a notional piece in the middle. Um, through the BAA, um, we are actually asking for specific commercial um, and partnership opportunities on how we expand uh, the relevance and extensibility of these systems to look at things like in situ resource utilization, additional asteroid sample collection, this lunar Mars mission scenarios, how do we, how do we enable this through these fundamental capabilities we have. Uh, the yellow box there is specifically uh, the area where we're actually actively working with the, the BAA call that you hear about from Chris here in a little bit. Um, but what are the missions that look like next after the initial human interaction with the asteroid? What are those, what should be the next capabilities that we're advancing and extensibility of those? So next slide. This, this enables that multiple pathway future um, from everything from this asteroid exploitation missions. Is it just one or is it multiple? Is it working with our international partners in the lunar vicinity to enable and work with their missions and contribute to their missions that they run in that area to building the fundamental stack um, of vehicle capabilities that we are going to take to Mars. Uh, you see, what we're looking at here is fundamental capabilities that build upon each other. They're modular in sense, they're evolutionary as common building blocks, and we're not reinventing what we need every time. We're actually building upon 
um, our paths and, and, and contributions that we've made both domestically and, and with our international partners in order to enable um, the, really this capability driven framework all the way to what Charlie gave us as the charge earlier today with um, humans um, uh, and boots on the ground at Mars as our uh, near term destination. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you all. Thank you. I think we have a little bit less than five minutes for questions if anyone we'll would like to ask. Some microphones in the audience. Sure. We can start right back. <clears throat> We'll, we'll bring him to you. Hi there. Hi, my name is Rick DeWitt, and um, this question is for Dan. Um, my question is really about small particles. Uh, in the future, uh, when we eventually learn how to use asteroid mass to fuel an electric mass driver rocket, uh, we'll be able to use every asteroid like a gas station. We will be able to hop from one to the next to the next to mine them. Uh, so mass drivers prefer to use really small particles because boulders are really hard to accelerate, right? So uh, the alternative approach uh, is, doesn't have the containment bag, right? So uh, those little tiny particles will probably slough off and might not be even available to pick up once we get to the moon with the, the humans. Um, so I noticed that you had the contingency sample collectors. I think those are extremely important. Um, and uh, so um, I noticed here, I, I am revising my question a little bit from what it was earlier. I was gonna complain about the hover mode concept, but you invented this hybrid mode concept. Um, so that pretty much uh, helps me out a lot. If you can just sample those small particles, make that a secondary mission objective, we can use that information to enable the ISRU later. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely, just comment is that's one of the, the, the nice aspects of interacting with the surface is you get a lot of information that, that extends planetary defense, resource, et cetera. Um, those contingency samples are really kind of a regolith sampling and a pristine sample that we can obtain through that contact. Next question, I believe, right here. Marshall, you mind, sir? Um, I have sort of the inverse question. What is your plan if, and this is to Dan, I guess, what is your plan if none of the rocks are coherent? Because I think that's actually quite likely that you'll find they're held together by Van der Waals forces or something. They may look like a boulder, but you pick them up and they just fall to pieces. Yeah, so um, actually, Thank you. We think that that is actually unlikely in the, in the effect that these boulders, um, the, the, uh, uh, the process by which these, bold, these asteroids are created, their collisions and their reaccretion at a very low velocity, um, if these were simply uh, non-coherent boulders, first of all, we wouldn't have meteorites. Um, we, would, we would not see coherent meteorites on the Earth. And second, they would slough into a non-coherent form um, due to the forces on, on an asteroid because of that collisional process. So we can't guarantee that, you know, this, the compressive strength is, uh, it can vary. So we're looking at that right now, what is the minimum compressive strength that we can tolerate. But we also have multiple boulder capture attempts. Um, again, we, we think that the, uh, the ability for the boulders to main, maintain their integrity uh, is a key aspect of picking up a boulder. If you go to the beach and you grab a grab a handful of sand and it falls through your fingertips, yeah, you're not going to bring back um, uh, material. But we think that based on the scientific knowledge that we have to date that the coherent boulders um, exist. If I could add real quick, that's actually one of the questions we're having the small bodies assessment group uh, look at uh, as what's, what's the characteristic of boulders uh, on these larger asteroids. And as Dan says, the initial look at it, because we uh, have these very uh, dense coherent meteorites on the ground. They obviously exist out there. It's a question of being able to uh, look around and, and find the right one to bring back. And, and that's point. fed into our, our risk mitigation activities that we're doing following on. Yes, Martin Elvis. Uh, Dan and Jim, I think I'm addressing. Your sensor suite 
has a pretty small uh, apertures, so I must, you must be assuming a pretty good orbit determination before you set off. You're not trying to find the asteroid en route and correct the course. I wondered how good that accuracy was that you're assuming. I think this question actually goes to Lindley. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, the uh, highest uh, uh, viable candidates uh, that we have on our list are those asteroids which we have very good orbits for. In fact, uh, our orbits are good enough that uh, we believe it, uh, well, I not believe, we've demonstrated that uh, when they come back two or three years later, they're within a degree or two of where we expected them in the sky. So, so we're looking at, at uh, asteroids that, uh, uh, you know, we categorize the orbit, how good we know the orbit, uh, confidence in the orbit of, of one or two. And we believe with the sensors we have, we can, ident we can find the asteroid even 50,000 kilometers away and, and then rendezvous with it. Yeah, and, for, the, and for, the, for visiting a large asteroid, we potentially have, or we have robotic precursor, um, and we, we know the orbit very, very well to basically orbit a condition of zero, I mean, precisely. One question from Twitter. One question from Twitter? Yeah. Well, we actually have, um, a the same question from Twitter coming in a couple of times, and I thought I'd ask our panel to address it. That is, um, we're talking about asteroids a lot right now. Are we in any danger? Yeah. Well, our, our handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is no object uh, in our catalog, cat uh, catalog right now uh, that is a danger of impact in the Earth uh, in the next hundred years. Uh, we have a few uh, that we are monitoring because they are in orbits uh, that do come very close to Earth's orbit, and, uh, and so we want to continue to take observations uh, of them and, and uh, be able to understand their orbit. But there's a lot out there that uh, we still need to find, and that's uh, why the continuation of the Near-Earth Object uh, Program uh, uh, goes on. Uh, so that we can can find uh, all the potentially hazardous objects uh, down to uh, a few tens of meters in size, and there are literally thousands out there uh, that we still need to find and and track and follow up. And uh, actually, our students over here are helping us with uh, with that part of it and getting follow up observations uh, on those uh, objects that we do find. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Michelle and panel. We'll have our next panel uh, start to come up and take their seats. Uh, so just a reminder, we you saw a lot of presentations there, uh, a lot of detailed charts. Uh, our goal is after each panel, uh, to the extent uh, the electrons allow it to happen fast, uh, to go ahead and put those up on nasa.gov slash asteroid forum. Uh, so be sure to, to check there periodically if you'd like to refer back to any of the charts you see, see here today, nasa.gov slash asteroid forum. Uh, and just a reminder, you can, you can keep uh, your questions coming on Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, for now, I am going to introduce our next panel moderator. You're going to hear a little bit more about the broad agency announcement uh, that we issued uh, from, from NASA last Friday. You can find that BAA at nasa.gov slash asteroid initiative and a link to it. We put out a press release on that as well with some good descriptive information on it. Uh, but here to talk a little bit more about it is our next moderator, Chris Moore, who is the Deputy Director of Advanced Exploration Systems Division, <laughs> Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate here in Washington. Chris. Good afternoon. In this panel, we're going to give you some general information about the BAA and try to answer any questions you may have. Uh, let me start by making introductions. Uh, we have Jason Raboyne. Uh, he's going to cover the asteroid capture systems. Uh, Heather Hinkle will discuss the rendezvous sensors. Mike Barrett will talk about adapting commercial spacecraft for the asteroid redirect mission. Andy Petro will talk about partnership opportunities for secondary payloads. And Mark McDonald will talk about <laughs> partnership opportunities for the crewed mission. So I'll give you some general information about the BAA and then we'll go to our panel to talk about the five technical areas 
And then we had some submitted questions, and I'll go through those at the end, and then we'll open it up to the floor for additional questions. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? So these are the objectives of the broad agency announcement. Uh, the first is to build upon the over 400 ideas we received from our request for information and that we synthesized in our workshops uh, last fall. Uh, we'd really like to engage the external community in asteroid initiatives, so we're doing that by involving you in system studies and technology development activities and in potential partnership opportunities. And we're trying to provide alternative system concepts uh, that would feed into the asteroid redirect mission, mission concept review. Uh, which we plan to hold uh, later this year or early next year. Okay, next, please. Okay, there are five main topic areas for the broad agency announcement. Asteroid capture systems are looking for uh, deployable structures and autonomous robotic manipulators. Uh, rendezvous sensors that can be used on both the asteroid uh, redirect vehicle and Orion, uh, trying to adapt uh, commercial spacecraft development uh, capabilities uh, for the asteroid redirect mission spacecraft. Uh, we'd like to do feasibility studies of potential partnerships uh, for secondary payloads that could be launched either on the asteroid redirect mission or on the space launch system and studies of potential partnership opportunities for the crewed mission. Uh, these include advancing science, in situ resource utilization, and um, enabling commercial activities and enhancing uh, U.S. Uh, exploration capabilities in uh, cislunar space. Next, please. This is a summary of the available funding and anticipated number of awards. Uh, there's approximately $6 million total um, that could be awarded through this BA, it depends on the quality of the proposals we receive. And we intend to award um, four to six uh, contracts in each of the five areas. The individual award amounts are uh, ranging from $500,000 for um, the capture systems to $50,000 for some of the uh, initial feasibility studies for potential partnerships. Next slide, please. So to help us plan our evaluation process, we strongly encourage proposers to submit a notice of intent. It's not required. You can still submit a proposal later if you decide to do that, but it helps us to organize our evaluation panels. So in addition to your contact information, it's really important if you could identify which of the five areas you're going to propose in. You may not know that at this time, that's okay, but if you do, please let us know because that helps us uh, a lot to organize things. And you can send that uh, notice of intent to me at the uh, email address listed in the BAA. Next slide, please. So we're trying to minimize the workload on both you as proposers and on us as evaluators. So we're trying to keep the proposals fairly short, uh, no more than 20 pages. And there are specific page limits listed in the BAA for each section. And you can see a list of the eight uh, sections there and the types of information we are requesting for each one are described in the BAA. And we'd like you to email the, your proposal in PDF format uh, to the uh, email address that's listed there in the BAA. Next, please. These are our criteria for evaluating proposals. Um, we are looking at relevance, uh, how relevant is the proposal to the objectives described in the announcement and to the uh, specific um, 
system requirements in the appendices. Uh, technical merit, we're going to evaluate the uh, quality, depth, and thoroughness of the technical approach in addition to the capabilities of the organization to perform the work and the experience of key personnel. And then the final criterion is cost. How reasonable is your cost proposal for the amount of work that's being performed? Next, please. These are some key dates uh, for the BAA process. Uh, we did issue the BAA last Friday, March 21st. And we'd like to receive the notices of intent by next Friday, April 4th. Uh, we're giving you 45 days to write your proposals. Um, so they're due on May 5th. Uh, we will be evaluating the proposals in the uh, May and June timeframe and awarding contracts. And then the work would begin on the contracts around the 1st of July. And these studies would run six months. They would conclude in December. Um, we've adjusted the schedule so that it lines up with the um, time frame for the mission concept review because we really are going to be using these studies to inform the mission concept review and we, we value your inputs through that process. Next slide, please. So if you have any general questions about the solicitation, uh, please email me. And if it's a technical question, I'll refer to one of our technical experts in the appropriate area. And we will try to give you a, a written answer as soon as we can. Uh, all the answers that we give will be posted on the web for other people to access and read. And the uh, BAA website um, has a lot of useful information about the system studies that have been done to date and some of the technical areas, so please refer to that. Okay, so um, now I'm going to turn it over to our panelists, and uh, first is uh, Jason Reboyne, and he's going to talk about asteroid capture systems. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here. As Chris said, my name is Jason Reboyne. I'm from the Structural Engineering Division at the Johnson Space Center. And I'll be talking about the capture systems portion of the broad, broad uh, agency announcement. Um, before I begin, I'd like to uh, recap some of the key events that led us up to today. Next slide, please. Uh, back in September of 2011 and up to April of 2012, the Keck Institute for Space Studies uh, conducted in the initial asteroid retrieval feasibility study uh, involving multiple centers and academia. The outcome of that study uh, resulted in an initial concept that used a mechanical deployable bag to capture a small near-Earth asteroid. And you can see that depicted just to the right of that bullet. Uh, then later in January 2013, uh, JPL started further developing the concept and evolving it into the inflatable system that you saw Mr. Muirhead present earlier. Then uh, between February 2012 and uh, April 2013, NASA conducted its own independent internal uh, assessment of capture systems to look at alternate ways uh, to conduct this mission. Uh, the study resulted in two concepts, an alternate inflatable design as well as a mechanical manipulator or robotic arm concept that would either retrieve an entire NEA or a small portion of boulder off a larger NEA. Following that study, the Langley Research Center then began developing the alternate concept uh, for using robotic arms to retrieve the small boulder off the larger, the larger parent body, which Mark Masnick also presented earlier. Finally, in the summer of 2013, NASA then released the request for information soliciting your ideas for the reference mission, which culminated into the uh, workshop at the Lunar, Planet, Lunar Planetary Institute in November of 2013. Related to capture systems, over 40 ideas were actually submitted, 10 of which were reviewed and presented. So over the course of this time uh, period, the majority of the ideas that we've received, both internally and externally, can be basically uh, formed into two groups. Uh, one around a, a deployable bag or net, which encapsulates the asteroid and, and retrieves it, or the utilization of sort of large manipulator robotic arm to capture the NEA or portion of it off a parent body. 
Uh, there were also many other what we called subsystem concepts that could be utilized in conjunction with the main concept, either improve its performance or enhance its capability. And I'll mention a few here in a minute. Next slide, please. Also, as Kristen mentioned, he, uh, some of the objectives of the BAA is to build upon the RFI inputs and the recommendations coming out of the workshop. Uh, related to capture systems, uh, the, uh, we wanted to go investigate trades, uh, trades against how to actually deploy the capture bag uh, using a non-inflatable method so we could contrast that against the reference concept. While taking an in-depth look into the complexity, uh, the mass of those systems, uh, the detumble and dynamics of the capture event itself, as well as how to restrain and retract the asteroid against the spacecraft. Also at that time, there was perceived risk of damaging the large arrays and antennas on the spacecraft during the actual capture event and, and detumbling the asteroid. So we are looking at investigating ways to pre, uh, precondition or detumble the asteroid prior to the capture event, or look at ways to make the spacecraft itself more robust against the event itself. Okay, next slide. So now focusing in on the uh, small asteroid capture option, um, the key technical challenges here are capturing and obviously de-spinning the asteroid that has an uncertain mass, size, shape, and spin rate, while being composed of material that may be made up of loose rocks or a rubble pile. To mitigate some of that risk uh, re related to this very low TRL system, NASA is interested in developing alternate designs for packaging, deploying, closing, and restraining the capture bag. This would all be done in parallel with the internal efforts here going at NASA on the, the reference concept of the inflatable design, and then would help us inform ourselves in down-selecting to a single flight system for flight system development. NASA is particularly interested in, in um, looking at non-inflatable or hybrid ways of deploying and retracting the capture bag, as well as the materials that are used for those systems that are compatible with deep space long duration missions. Uh, some of the key driving requirements uh, for acquiring an entire NEA are being able to handle an asteroid with a mean diameter between 4 and 10 meters with a maximum di dimension up to 13 meters. Uh, it's expected that these asteroids could have a mass up to 1,000 metric tons with rotational rates up to a half a revolution per minute. And again, the integrity of the asteroid is unknown. Uh, proposals need to focus on the detailed technical approach of the design, the analysis, the fabrication methods, the laboratory testing of a subscale concept, especially those, uh, those techniques on how to validate the system in the zero-G operations in a 1G environment. Okay. Next slide. For the robotic bowler capture option, the key technical challenges here are obviously the autonomous operations in capturing of the extracting the bowler from the surface while flying in formation with the, large and par the larger parent body. Again, the bowler will be char characterized prior to capture, but its pr precise friability is likely to be unknown in the capture process until the capture process is underway. Again, here NASA is particularly interested in the autonomous operations and refining the bowler capture sequence including nominal and contingency operation scenarios, uh, development of end effectors and grippers, supporting sensors and six-stop simulations of all operational phases, approaches for determining mechanical strength of the boulder prior to capture, and contingency sample collection concepts. Some of the key driving requirements for this option are here to accommodate a boulder between one and five meters extent in any direction, with a mass of up to 30 metric tons, a compressive strength of greater than uh, 0.3 megapascals, and with apparent asteroid rotation rate less than one-third revolution per hour. You'll also notice on the chart and in the broad area or the broad agency announcement that uh, NASA is also interested in systems that can be expanded or extended up to larger asteroid, and those and increased driving requirements are specified. Again, with this proposal, uh, the options. I need to focus on the technical design approach. Uh, launch packaging, including launch analysis, will be critical to this system. Uh, simulation analysis, fabrication, and laboratory testing of a subscale system, again, to validate these zero-G operations in a 1G environment. That's all I have today. Uh, thank you very much. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague from JSC, Heather Hinkle, who will talk about uh, rendezvous sensors. Thanks, Jason.
Um, I'm Heather Hinkle. I have the privilege to talk to you today about rendezvous sensors, and it's one of the appendices in the BAA. Next slide, please. So over the formulation of these missions, it occurred to us that, as Dan and Brian mentioned earlier, autonomous rendezvous and docking and capturing these asteroids are all very similar. Docking and capturing these asteroids and all the precision that you need to do those um, operations are very similar. So we stepped back and formed a multi-center team and we looked at can we, if we step back and, and look at all the missions needs from across their AR&D, can we get a set of sensors that can operate for all of these missions and meet their needs? So um, along with the RFIs that we received from the community, we really discovered that everybody is using a very similar set of things. So what we, we came down to is, yeah, we think we can do this with a common suite of sensors for all of these missions, both the robotic concepts and the crewed mission. So what it came down to were visible cameras were a very important part of all of the sensor suites. And we kind of pared it down to medium resolution and high resolution. You could also think of those as narrow angle cameras and wide angle cameras based on the job that they're doing during their portion of the mission. So we tried to separate that out from what kind of lens you're using because the lenses is very specific and configurable per mission needs. But medium and high resolution cameras were an important part of the suite. Um, also three dimensional LIDARs, whether scanning or flash, um, that's a critical part of the near operations for docking or capturing the asteroid or capturing the boulder. So when, um, when you get into that phase, having that knowledge in three dimensions is very important. Um, another part of the mission, and it was in many of the RFIs we received, were infrared cameras. And NASA recognizes that there's a very good potential for infrared cameras for the future, and there's a lot of capability there. And they're really kind of considered as a robustness and situational awareness for these missions. So we've included that as a part of the suite and in looking forward. So offers to the BAA are welcome to submit for a single sensor or multiple sensors. The whole suite, we're very open to whatever your company has to offer. Um, what NASA did was created a common specification based on the needs of the three missions and picked what were the driving things per each mission in the areas of environment and in the areas of performance to do the rendezvous proximity operations and docking or capture. Next slide, please. So this is just a very high level concept of operations and the appendix has a lot more detail about the concepts of operation for AR and D for all three of the missions. So as you can see for the crude operations in the long and, mi and medium range, there's a, a couple of um, specific things that are needed because a crew timeline is so short during this phase. So they have a matter of hours to perform this whole thing versus weeks or days um, for the robotic missions. So there's an S-band transponder that's not a part of the common suite. The far right column will show you which of these missions, what they use from the common suite. So S-band transponder, star tracker for bearing, um, instead of flying a narrow angle camera, and then a high resolution camera for bearing as well as a backup. Then as you get closer, as mentioned, a 3D LiDAR comes into play, and this is to allow precise alignment of the docking mechanisms to perform the docking. We also use the high resolution camera to perform this operation. So then moving into the small asteroid capture, they have a narrow angle camera, or we call medium resolution camera in the common suite, and that's used for all the far out operations starting at 50,000 kilometers, for acquiring the asteroid, for characterizing it and determining the spin rate, and all the things as they move closer, um, and then transitioning over again into a 3D LiDAR so that as the bag is starting to get closer and closer, you are able to see the entire asteroid and the edges of that asteroid as you enter the bag. And someone mentioned in a question about the fields of view of these sensors, that is one of the key drivers that comes out of this common uh, spec that we came up with, is that is um, something that's necessary as a wider field of view so you can see that whole asteroid entering the bag. And moving into the robotic boulder capture, um, there's sort of two ARNDs here. One, you have to get yourself to the larger asteroid, and during that, use a medium resolution camera. You're getting bearing to the asteroid as you get closer. You do those flybys, and you start transitioning to multiple cameras so that now not only are you navigating yourself around, but you're also identifying features on the surface, identifying target boulders that you can go and grab. Then as you get closer and you start getting ready to approach a boulder, you transition again to a 3D LiDAR, and you get all the precise ranging and attitude information to go and approach that asteroid at those slow rates you saw in the video and grab that asteroid with your arms and capture it to leave the surface. 
So their um, cameras and lidars are used in that phase as well. And again, infrared cameras are being looked at as a part of robustness for these, um, all these mission concepts. Next slide, please. So in the BAA, we intend to fund um, vendors to look at existing s sensors out there, cameras and 3D lidars and infrared cameras, and design and risk reduction technology maturation. So we've included a lot of information for you about the concepts of operation. We have further details if needed on the website. Um, we've included those common specification tables I mentioned for the environmental and the performance. Um, we also are requesting as a part of the BAA ideas since we know as technology increases, how are we able to go ahead and feed these technologies into this common suite and maybe incrementally upgrade as time goes on. We have other missions like satellite servicing, um, very similar to descent and landing missions and hazard avoidance. There's a lot of other NASA missions out there that could take advantage of these things. We'd like to see what your ideas are to evolve this suite as technology advances. Um, we also have a lot of detail in there about what we'd like you to answer as a part of your proposal. Um, so we're really looking forward to your ideas. I think this is a great way for the agency to find collaboration and save money across the programs. And we look forward to your responses. Thank you. Um, I'd like to next introduce Mike Barrett from Glenn. Thanks, Thanks Heather. Uh, so I'm Mike Barrett. I'm from Glenn Research Center. Um, I'm leading the development activity for the SCP module uh, in the reference configuration and then also coordinating the portion of the BAA related to the adaptation of commercial spacecraft or capabilities, um, primarily to reduce development costs. So next slide. Um, and so you can see in the BAA, uh, the primary objective of this section, Appendix C in the BAA, is to reduce development cost. So you heard earlier with the first panel, uh, Brian and Dan gave you a, a brief summary of the reference configurations that we have uh, for the internal design work. Uh, the, the message here for, related to SEP particularly the SEP module in both of those designs is essentially the same. So we have those reference configurations, um, and then we have the associated cost and schedule estimates uh, with them. So really what Appendix C of this BAA um, allows us to do is it affords the opportunity for us to solicit U.S. industry for your input um, and to assess whether or not uh, we could take advantage of some existing commercial assets, uh, whether it's spacecraft, whether it's a spacecraft design modified, um, or other capabilities again, to reduce development costs um, as we move forward in developing the asteroid uh, redirect vehicle. Um, these, the appendix C is looking for industry-led studies, their concept studies, um, and so uh, that appendix will allow us uh, to get your, your inputs for that and compare them to the baseline. We do intend to use the, the results of uh, these proposals uh, in the MCR, in the mission concept review, uh, in the February 15 timeframe. Uh, you'll notice in the, in the wording in the BAA, um, it talks about the feed-forward aspects of uh, not just an SEP module, but perhaps a combined SEP module and mission module. Um, I think it uses the word uh, spacecraft or SEP tug, um, but some type of transport vehicle uh, with definitely applicability to ARM, um, but you've heard the recurring theme uh, all afternoon about the feed-forward aspects of the mission and the vehicle. Um, particularly with respect to our ability to move um, assets uh, for future exploration activities. So uh, definitely we would like the proposals to focus um, not only on ARM but on how it feeds forward based on the material that you've uh, heard today and you've been given on the website. Uh, I just do need to note, so in terms of eligibility of the participants, um, it, this is restricted to U.S. industry um, and for our industry friends in the audience, uh, we also do not want you to team with a NASA center or with JPL um, in your preparation of these proposals. So there were some questions that we got earlier about that. Um, and so it's not only uh, just a U.S. industry-led proposal activity, but there's no teaming um, that's allowed on these proposals uh, with other NASA entities. Next chart, please. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, point out some of the, uh, I won't call them requirements, I'll call them considerations at this point. Um, but it, it lets you know what we're doing internally in terms of how we're assessing uh, different design options. Um, so you need to be aware of these as you, as you look at how to adapt um, or to just basically use the spacecraft designs that, that you may have in pocket. Um, certainly the ARV needs to be capable of being launched on a single launch vehicle. Um, and currently we've looked at Atlas V, Delta IV Heavy, Falcon Heavy, or SLS for those launch vehicles. Um, and Brian showed you a chart earlier about what that launch vehicle selection does in terms of ability to return mass or timelines as well. Um, the solar electric propulsion system in the module uh, is an uh, end user of about 40 kilowatts at beginning of life. 
the uh, thrusters that are being used, our hall thrusters, uh, on the reference design, but uh, the specific impulse that we're working to is between two and 3,000 seconds. The vehicle, in terms of environments, has to handle 0.7 to 1.7 AU um, regarding uh, radiation temperature control, COM. Uh, currently, the de uh, design that we're looking at uh, has a maximum capacity of 10 metric tons of storage of xenon. Uh, a lot of the uh, mission designs for ARM don't require that much mass of xenon, but again, as you heard earlier, uh, not only is the architecture being capability uh, driven in terms of design, but all the way down to the module, right, in this mission, it's very much a capability driven design at this point. And so the maximum is, is 10 metric tons, um, but certainly as low as two uh, metric tons we would entertain looking at. Uh, operational lifetime is six years in deep space, all right, so that also affects in terms of rad tolerance of, of, of the systems. And then uh, certainly depending on which mission we end up with, um, how we would implement a highly reliable system would be open uh, to design consideration and trades. But um, at this point, you need to take a, a look at both of the uh, references uh, in terms of capturing a smaller asteroid or um, going in uh, to a larger asteroid in terms of prox ops in either case. Um, and think about the, what's an appropriate level of redundancy and which systems in the designs that we might need so that we have an acceptable reliability at the system level. Next chart. So this is my one chart just to emphasize uh, in terms of capability-driven aspects of the design. All right, so uh, the SEP module obviously is a modular element in the overall ARV. Um, the feed-forward aspects of the design it needs to have the smarts that are on the mission module and our reference configuration as well as we, as we think about that. But primarily in terms of how applicable, and I'm trying to help you here with your relevance uh, assessment criteria in the BAA, um, we need to be able to look at, again, not only an ARM mission, and the uh, asteroids that are noted here for ARM, these are notional curves, but it gives you an idea. So that current capability that we have in terms of maximum 3,000 second thruster um, specific impulse and a, a 10 metric ton storage capacity, right, that puts us up in the upper right corner of that chart. Um, and as we deviate from that maximum capacity, we do two things um, that are significant. One, we significantly reduce the design space that we have for the ARM mission itself, right? And we're still um, searching for the right asteroid to go get. Um, so maintaining the flexibility in that design space is important. But the other thing that you do is you also begin to limit um, how the SEP uh, tug, if you want to call it that, how the SEP tug feeds forward for exploration and enables us to do different missions downstream. So as you're looking at adapting uh, your existing spacecraft or a modification to the design, please do try to consider that and how it feeds forward. That's all I had. Okay, I'm Andy Petro, and I'm going to be talking about uh, potential future partnerships for secondary payloads. Uh, next chart. Okay, the um, payloads that we're talking about could address uh, commercial interests such as asteroid resource prospecting, uh, demonstration of planetary defense capabilities, uh, or address strategic knowledge gaps uh, for future human exploration. Uh, next chart. Okay, uh, these are the types of secondary payloads we're talking about. Uh, they could be a science instrument that is attached to the armed vehicle mission module, uh, and that's something up to about 10 kilograms, and uh, that's illustrated in the uh, drawing below. Uh, the envelope for that on the side of the vehicle. Um, it could be a spacecraft deployed from the armed vehicle or launched separately. In the case of uh, launching from the armed vehicle, we're talking about uh, CubeSat payloads uh, and um, a, a six, U, six uh, CubeSat unit uh, equivalent uh, type of payload or set of payloads for that. And that again is shown uh, the dispensers for those are shown on the side of the drawing on the uh, vehicle. Um, could also have CubeSat class payloads uh, deployed from the space launch system or other launch vehicles. Um, uh, that could also include kinetic impactors that would be launched with the arm vehicle or separately. And uh, another concept could be low cost regolith uh, or contingency sample collection concepts that could uh, be part of the armed vehicle. And again, the drawing below shows where those secondary payloads could be accommodated on the armed vehicle in the reference concept. And then on the right, just show the um, launch vehicle adapter for the space launch system and the concept for um, accommodating secondary payloads on that launch vehicle. Uh, these would be 6 to 12U type 
payloads uh, that would be deployed from the vehicle um, on an earth uh, escape type trajectory. So we can go to the next uh, chart. Uh, the awards for this, uh, we would um, consider preliminary feasibility studies um, that would be funded uh, up to $50,000 each um, under this BAA. Any future partnership agreement, so would be selected uh, under a separate solicitation uh, following this one. Uh, for the actual um, partnership, there would be no funding provided for the development of the payload, um, but for any selected uh, payloads, uh, NASA would be providing the integration, launch, and mission operation support at no cost uh, to the partner. Uh, the eligible partners, uh, participants are listed there. Um, I think we're very anxious to see the ideas that, that um, all of you are able to uh, provide for this. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mark McDonald, the next speaker. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark McDonald. I lead the uh, Advanced Mission Development Group supporting Steve Stitch on the crew mission. And I'm here to talk to you today about the potential future partnerships supporting the crew mission. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm very excited about this particular portion of the BAA because we, we get to do the, the fun stuff that looks forward to what, what Mr. Bolden talked about and going to Mars. Steve Stitch had a uh, slide in his chart that showed how we can use these ARM technologies to extend to a crewed mission to Phobos, the first human mission to a Mars moon. To me, that's really exciting. When I, when I talk to the kids from intermediate schools, that's where they get pumped up. That's where my kids get pumped up. So in this, in this portion of the BAA, we get to listen to your ideas. So Jason Cruzan had some pitches in his where he showed different modules using these ARM SEP vehicles where we could do deep space missions, all right, go, to go farther than humans have ever gone before, to partner with international partners, to pursue interest with the Global Exploration Roadmap to go to the, back to the moon. So there's a lot of opportunity here for partnerships. On a smaller scale, there's partnership opportunities on the crewed mission to do things like ISRU, to utilize the asteroid that we're capturing to do more with it. So next slide, please. The challenge, and that's, the, that's what makes it fun to work at NASA, is they don't give us easy stuff to do. All deep space missions are very mass challenged, and this one is no different. The crew mission is, is limited to two crew in order to get the mass down so that the SLS rocket can deliver the Orion to this distant retrograde orbit farther than humans have ever gone before. So adding more mass to do a partnership payload or to do, do something on this mission is challenging. So in the BAA, we not only want to hear your ideas for partnering on the crew mission uh, for things like ISRU and things to better utilize the initial asteroid mission, but those BAA proposals have to consider how are we going to get the mass there? So there, there has to be consideration of the total problem that we're solving. So on the extensibility things, it opens up more. Because now we can, be, we can talk about concepts of adding modules with additional launches in order to enable future exploration missions, like I mentioned before, for the Moon and Mars. So the eligibility requirements are similar to what Andy described. So we, we want to hear your ideas, and we look forward to a bright future with that. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Chris for the summary. OK, thank you, all. Um, these are some frequently asked questions that we received in advance of this forum. So I'd like to go over the answers to those uh, first, and then we'll open it up to further questions. So the first question was, uh, can an organization submit more than one proposal? Uh, yes, you can. There's no limit on the number of proposals uh, per organization. The second question is, can an organization be awarded a study in more than one topic area? The answer is yes. It depends on the quality of proposals that we receive, but there is no restriction on having multiple awards from the same uh, organization. Uh, will each proposal be expected to address only one of the BAA topic areas? Uh, yes, because we have different eligibility and funding requirements uh, for each topic area. So it's hard to, to uh, span those different areas with a single proposal. 
Uh, number four, can an organization partner with the NASA Center or JPL on a proposal? Uh, the answer is no, and our intent is not to have the government competing with industry or academia. The main objective of this BAA is to get ideas and system concepts uh, from outside the government. Um, we're also funding the NASA centers and JPL for the asteroid redirect mission internally. So for those reasons, uh, we've restricted participation by NASA civil servants and JPL employees. Number five, can federally funded research and development centers submit proposals? No, uh, FFRDCs are government sponsored organizations and again, we don't intend to have the government compete against industry. Uh, we realize that the BA is not exactly clear on this point, so we're going to uh, post a modification to, to clarify that uh, later today. So those are some of the common questions we received so far, um, and now we can open it up uh, for further questions. Take the questions. We have some microphones moving through the audience, and we'll start right down here. Me? All right. Marshall Banks here. Yes. Um, so I have a couple of questions, which are also probably frequently asked, and they have to do with foreign participation. Um, if your organization has arranged relationships with foreign entities, like say subcontractors, is that an issue here? And the related question is: Are there ITAR issues here? So foreign institutions may propose in most cases, except for uh, Appendix C, which is restricted only to U.S. industry. However, uh, our relationship with a foreign institution would be on a no exchange of funds uh, basis. So we would have to work out you know, that's, international that's not quite agreements. That's not quite what I asked. What I asked was, could a company, for example, one of the companies I deal with has a, has a partnership, not a partnership, but it has a subcontract that's a foreign country, that's in the yeah. EU. Um, is, that, is that subcontractor out of bounds? Uh, I believe that's okay. I, I need to get back to you on that. There okay. are restrictions in the BAA against uh, having subcontractors from China. So be sure and read that section. And then there is an explanation of the ITAR regulations in the PAA that you must comply with. Thank you. But I will, I will uh, get back to you on that subcontractor question. OK, here in the middle section, close to where we just took a question. Nicole. Hi, on the uh, secondary payloads uh, section, there's a very broad range of activities from precursors out to uh, unrelated asteroids to helper spacecraft uh, for the ARV. Uh, would you allow, encourage, or discourage multiple proposals from a single company in that section? Because the, the range of things to be addressed is very broad. Well, again, um, referring back to the frequently asked questions that I just answered, uh, you can submit as many proposals as you like, and there's no limit per area. Even in a single topic? Even in a single topic. Thanks. Hi, Joe Cassidy, Aerojet Rocketdyne. I guess this is for Appendix C, so I guess for you, Mike. Um, you mentioned that um, your interest is in looking at these concepts from a cost reduction standpoint or cost saving standpoint. Um, what is the mechanism by which we can get the data to be able to compare against the uh, government internal concepts? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you can. Um, we're going to make that comparison. Well, what I would just say is make sure that your offer is as competitive as you can make it. <laughs> Other questions in the audience? Okay, let's go to Twitter. I think we have one there. We do. We actually have a couple of uh, other questions on eligibility, which I'll kind of combine here. Um, are not-for-profit institutions and universities precluded from participating, and what about 
um, individuals or small companies, small organizations? So uh, universities and nonprofits may submit proposals. Uh, they're non-government institutions, so those are acceptable. Um, individuals may submit proposals if they think they have the capabilities to perform the um, studies and they have demonstrated experience, but we will look at that in the evaluation. And I'm sorry, what was the other question? Small companies, small organizations. Small companies, absolutely, they may propose. There's no limit on the types of organizations other than that they have to be non-government institutions. Okay, it's all the way in the back. Hi, quick question about the uh, requirements for the uh, space segment, the SEP uh, segment. Um, you mentioned 3,000 seconds and uh, 10,000 kilograms of xenon as the desired level uh, that you'd like to see that I guess could encompass many of the missions. But the question I have for you is, um, will you make something more specific that says that here are like the minimums that uh, you would like to see uh, as the solution space for this? Because the differences can affect the system dramatically, as you can imagine. So uh, having something a bit more specific to to propose, to demonstrate, to, uh, to design to would be very helpful, I think. Yeah, so uh, in the current uh, release of the BAA, there are minimums. So the 2,000 second um, ISP and the 2,000 kilogram uh, storage capacity are the low end of the range, right? Um, so uh, I'm not trying to be vague. It's just that we're under the same type of um, um, uncertainty in, of the objectives and what would eventually be requirements, right? So our current design um, has picked that uh, 10 metric ton and 3,000 second design point, which is on that chart that I showed you. But the range that we've looked at, and it's not to say that there are not some missions that uh, would come in well below that. Um, in fact, most of the, the mission studies that we've done don't require 10 metric tons of xenon. Um, but as soon as we, again, as soon as we start to deviate from that design space or to start to narrow that, that design space, even just for ARM, we also impact downstream. So the range is in there, and um, there may be, you know, a degree of modification to existing capabilities that would vary, and I imagine cost and schedule would vary with that as well. Um, and I can't tell you where the attractive point would be at this point because, Frankly, for ARM in particular, um, the observation campaign will be a huge factor, right, on what drives us to a final set of requirements for that mission. So I'm kind of talking around that. I, I can tell you the answer is yes, there is a minimum. It's specified in the BAA. That's the 2,000 seconds and the uh, two metric tons. Um, but I do think it would be useful um, for, the, for us to see if you think there's a parametric, you know, type of extrapolation or something like that on an existing capability that you have. That might be something that would uh, would certainly be helpful for us. Not required, um, and the range that is specified in there is what we're talking about in terms of design space. I just want to put out a reminder that you can find the broad agency announcement at nasa.gov slash asteroid initiative. We have a link there to the procurement site where you can read the, the, uh, the entirety of it. Let's go back here. Uh, for the crewed mission partnerships, uh, it's very mass constrained, as you noted. Do you have any way to bound that? Is it a one kilogram add-on is okay, but a 10 kilogram add-on would be impossible? What, what's your thinking? I would, I would say that anything more than 100 kilograms would be extremely problematic. Less than that, it would be a value proposition on what the payload was offering to the mission for its, for its mass constraint hit. This might be for um, all the appendix. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear what the uh, expectation of the final product was in December. Is it a um, set of drawings, just a, a concept uh, with you know summary, an actual model? Uh, what, what is the expectation? Well, we have uh, three deliverables listed in the BAA. There's an initial kickoff meeting at one of the NASA centers um, where you would brief your proposed study and get some guidance from the NASA technical experts. 
there's an interim report that's due at the end of October. Uh, that's just a summary of the work you've done uh, to date. That's a, that's a, a briefing, and that's to help inform our mission concept review. And then in December, there's a final report. Um, there's a statement of work for an optional phase two contract um, and the cost estimate, you know, associated with that optional phase two contract. Let's go back to an online question. Um, it's, we have a question on rendezvous sensors. Uh, are you also interested in algorithms and software associated with the rendezvous sensors? So in the BAA, we've limited it to the sensors. Um, when we did our commonality assessment, the, um, there's certainly the opportunity for sharing algorithms across missions, but every mission, the way they applied the measurements from the sensors was very specific. The flight software process was very specific to each mission. So we determined at this point we really where we felt the government could get a key amount of savings was in the commonality of the rendezvous sensors, and we wanted to focus on that for now. Great. Any uh, further questions here in the audience? Anything else online? Go ahead. We have a, we have a couple of other questions. Um, one is, uh, may NASA develop technology be considered in the proposals? And how will the details of that be communicated to study teams? Well, again, we have prohibited you from partnering with NASA centers or JPL. Um, you are free to look at the study team um, presentations and reports to get an idea of the types of things NASA is working on. Uh, if you are selected for a contract, you will be working closely with NASA people in the course of your study. So we really want to see what your ideas on the outside are. We know what our ideas are. Um, it's the whole purpose, again, of this BAA is to gather ideas from the external community. Do you have one more? I do, actually. Uh, have any solar electric propulsion robotic prototypes been tested uh, that make the mission feasible? Um, well, I'll take a stab at the solar electric propulsion part of it. I mean, when, when you say that, it's at what level, right, that make the mission feasible? Um, so there have been um, technology efforts um, that have uh, culminated in test situations. Um, uh, it's, it's public knowledge, right, that STMD is funding two um, uh, solar array technology efforts right now. Um, though one of them is already in thermal vacuum test. The other one goes into test um, early next, let's see, in the next few months. Um, the, I, I don't know if that's what they're poking on. In terms of prototype, we've also done several uh, electric propulsion um, internal developments uh, as well that have been uh, tested. Uh, generally, that data is uh, publicly available, right, through research publications. Um, you can go to the STMD website, right, uh, seriously, right, and find a lot of links uh, to the information there. And for the folks on the earlier question as well, in terms of incorporated NASA technology, um, I think the, for you to get an idea on what NASA technology we've incorporated in the reference is to go over the material that's being posted based on Brian and Dan's um, brief overview of the reference earlier. It shows you what we think is needed or what we're using now. So. Okay, so Chris, if there's anybody out there that had questions and, and didn't quite get to them today, where do you want them to send those questions again? Yeah, so please email your questions to me at the email address listed both in the synopsis and in the BAA. It's hq-asteroid-baa at mail.nasa.gov. Okay, please help me thank our panel. And again, we'll, uh, we'll get the charts that you just saw up on nasa.gov slash asteroid forum in the BAA. You can find it at nasa.gov slash asteroid initiative. And I'm going to ask uh, Andy Petro to stay up here. He's the program executive uh, for the Space Technology Mission Directorate. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about technology needs. So on to you, Andy. Okay. 
wait for my first chart to come up. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's good. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the technology needs, some of the ongoing technology work uh, in relation to this mission, and also um, some additional technology development that could enhance the asteroid mission as well as extend our capabilities for exploration missions and uh, commercial applications. Go to the next chart, please. Uh, this is an outline of the topics uh, I was going to talk about today. Um, first, under solar electric propulsion, you have the solar arrays, the electric propulsion thrusters, power processing units, and propellant tanks. Um, these topics um, are not specifically addressed in the BAA, although, as we just discussed, um, looking at uh, ad adaptations of commercial vehicles, um, you know, would relate to uh, systems that would incorporate uh, some or all of these components or uh, variations of these components. Um, then the next area, asteroid rendezvous and capture, uh, that is addressed in the BAA. We just heard some uh, detailed discussion of the rendezvous sensors and the asteroid capture systems. Um, then under crewed missions, we have the EVA suits. Um, and then under the topic of enhancing and extending technologies, we have in situ resource utilization and other uh, additional technologies. Those uh, can be addressed through the partnership opportunities in the BAA uh, as well. So we can go to the next, um, which is to uh, talk a little bit about the solar array system. Um, what's needed for the mission um, is about 50 kilowatt solar array. Uh, and that could be, of course, uh, laid out as two, two wings. Um, and uh, you know, we're looking at an operating voltage of uh, 300 volts for the uh, reference concept. And you can see illustrated there two of the, um, the, the contracted um, developments under, underway now, a, uh, a rollout and a, a fold-out system. As uh, Mike said earlier, those are uh, being tested uh, at this time. Um, the other aspect of this is the solar cell technology itself. Uh, it's felt that the existing technology is adequate for the mission, although there would be interest in lower cost uh, solar cell technology that could be applied here, um, both for the uh, asteroid mission and, and beyond. So we can go to the next chart. Um, on uh, electric propulsion thrusters, the reference concept in the work that uh, the Space uh, Technology Mission Directorate is doing um, is a magnetically shielded hull thruster. Um, the, the technology need that's being addressed is a 12.5 kilowatt thruster. That, of course, would be multiplied by three to four uh, individual thrusters in the overall system, and uh, they're targeting an ISP of 3,000 seconds. The um, total amount of propellant needed, again, for this reference concept is about 10,000 kilograms of xenon. Um, the, uh, and the system that's being developed uh, at this point is considered adequate, uh, assuming rel you know, the reasonable amount of further development. However, um, you know, there would be interest in other types of systems um, that could uh, address this mission or be extensible for um, other exploration missions and in commercial applications beyond that. Uh, the next chart this is power processing units. These are the units that, that provide power to the individual thrusters. The um, Reference concept here is an input voltage of 300 volts and an output of 800 volts. Um, and that, that work, again, is under underway as well. And next chart is on the propellant tanks. Um, as I mentioned, the requirement um, is about 10,000 kilograms of xenon. Uh, the reference mission design has, or vehicle design has that divided into eight individual tanks. Uh, and, of course, a key parameter there is the mass fraction 
The goal is to uh, get that as low as possible. They feel 3.7% is, is achievable. Again, any improvement there would be extremely beneficial to the overall mission and for any other application of, of this type of propulsion. So moving on to the next uh, chart. Uh, rendezvous sensors, we heard quite a bit about that, uh, both the, you know, looking at visible and IR cameras and um, 3D LIDAR systems. Um, again, uh, that would be applied to this mission or to a variety of other missions as well. And we can go to the next chart. The asteroid capture systems, again, we heard some detail on that. Um, of course, the work is under, some work is underway in inflatable systems and also, uh, uh, to also space trust type uh, systems that could be used. Um, and again, this is a, a topic that would be uh, addressed in the BAA. Next chart. Uh, under the crewed systems, uh, main topic area is EVA suits. The work underway uh, that we did here describe in, in the first panel um, is in the uh, portable life support systems for those suits for the EVA activities. And also the suits uh, that are being developed are modifications of the advanced space, uh, advanced crew escape suits. Um, this is again considered adequate for the mission that, that uh, is being undertaken with the uh, asteroid um, mission. However, um, I'll talk in a moment about extensibility of that as well. Next chart, uh, in situ resource utilization. And here you have the, the, the uh, prospecting um, and then the processing of, of the resource once it is um, uh, collected, and then uh, manufacturing. And there is work underway, uh, at least in terms of looking at a, a lunar mission um, to prospect for volatiles and uh, also to process those into usable uh, materials. And the, the other area that is just really at the very beginning um, is 3D manufacturing. Uh, there'll be a 3D printer uh, tested on the International Space Station. And of course, that is um, just the beginning of, of what is a uh, uh, very, uh, potentially very productive way of ensuring that eventually we'll be able to be self-sufficient in space. So again, this is something in terms of partnerships uh, that could be addressed uh, from the BAA. And um, moving on to the final uh, chart, and this is just talking about some of the additional um, technologies that address both enhancing um, the capabilities for our mission uh, to the asteroid, but also um, addressing things that uh, enhance our capabilities for missions um, well beyond that. Uh, anything that would reduce the mass volume, uh, the power, or improve the uh, risk posture for the crew uh, for the Orion vehicle would be beneficial for the asteroid mission, <laughs> such as the logistics packaging, dust mitigation, uh, crew exercise equipment, sample, con sample containers. Those types of things uh, would be very beneficial. Um, in terms of the EVA suits, um, as I said, what's being developed is adequate, but uh, for other missions, uh, there is interest in uh, much more capable uh, both life support and uh, suit technology. Um, in terms of the uh, propulsion systems, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the systems being developed um, should be adequate for what we want to do in terms of the asteroid mission. However, there is a uh, great interest in more capable systems, um, higher power systems, 100 kilowatts and beyond, um, and uh, in addition to all thrusters, other propulsion technologies that might be applicable. Um, again, and then just going on a few other things, closed loop life support um, would of course be valuable, radiation shielding, long duration food storage, um, automated vehicle and uh, crew operations for the more distant exploration missions um, and uh, a variety of other things that, that would enhance our ability to do these missions. So um, I think that concludes what I wanted to summarize. I hope this has been helpful and uh, gives you an idea of what we need uh, in the near term for this mission 
and uh, what this could lead to um, well beyond that. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Andy. Now we will hear from uh, Jason Kessler, who is the Asteroid Grand Challenge Program Executive. Jason. Thank you, Trent. Uh, one of the great things about my job, uh, also one of the challenging things, is I get to follow such brilliant, dedicated people. Uh, it's uh, really been fantastic to see the progress that's been made. I want to uh, extend a special thanks to Michelle Gates and Chris Moore for leading their teams to get us here so successfully. So thank you both. If I could have my next slide, please. Uh, as a refresher, the grand challenge statement, uh, fairly simple uh, in its words, but pretty powerful uh, and profound in its meaning. Uh, we announced this grand challenge back in June of last uh, year. Uh, to reiterate the question that Lindley answered, we didn't uh, announced this grand challenge because there was an impending threat or uh, based on fear, but, but rather a recognition that we have a, a, a unique opportunity. Uh, Lindley Johnson and the team he has built, <clears throat> a global community has been working on this problem for quite some time. And as he identified, we're uh, above 95% in terms of identifying the uh, planet killer size asteroids. But as NASA has done successfully in the past, we've utilized open innovation as a means to engage uh, a community uh, to assist and, and see things in a different way, whether it's prizes, um, pa partnerships, crowdsourcing, citizen science. We've seen that this is successful. And we live in an age when the computing power in your hands, the network connectivity, and the educational uh, skills that we've attained are, are unsurpassed in human history. And so we believe that there's a cognitive resource that's out there that we can tap into uh, to help accelerate the great work that we're already doing. And so the grand challenge uh, was a recognition that uh, we're doing great work globally, uh, but there are folks that we're not currently engaged with, and can we, through those conversations, help accelerate the work that's already being done? If I could have the next slide, please. Here is an international update. Um, the Action Team 14 out of uh, UN Copuis has been working uh, for many years, uh, really significantly the last seven. Uh, and the recommendations that were accepted uh, led to um, the creation of the International Asteroid Warning Network as well as the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. Uh, 2014's been a, an exciting year on those fronts because the first charter meeting was held in Boston in January. Uh, and uh, the same page uh, shortly thereafter got together for a meeting in Darmstadt, Germany. The findings out of that charter meeting uh, of Iwan, two of them, uh, I wanted to draw attention to. The first is to encourage additional participation in the International Asteroid Warning Network and expand recruitment of other nations to the effort. The second finding uh, that I want to draw attention to is to enhance near-Earth object discovery and follow-up observations, whether it's astrometry, photometry, or spectroscopy, through further international cooperation and coordination, especially in the Southern Hemisphere. And the purpose of the same page, the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, is to prepare for an international response to a neo threat through the exchange of information, development of options for collaborative research and mission opportunities, and to conduct neo threat mitigation planning activities. 
I had the good fortune of uh, being able to present to UN Copius uh, in February. Uh, and uh, that led to an opportunity to meet with the Space Generation Advisory Council, uh, a great group of up and coming uh, space employees, whether they're engineers or scientists. They even have a NEO uh, working group. Got really excited about what we're talking about. Uh, additionally, the uh, ideas behind IWAN and same page, I think you can see in that last bullet, uh, we started moving out on. My boss, Deputy Chief Technologist Jim Adams, led a group to South Africa. And in collaboration with the IAU's Minor Planet Center, uh, worked on developing some curriculum that we hope we'll be able to replicate as we expand the conversation globally. Uh, South Africa, uh, as noted in the IWAN uh, recommendations, is uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, and we feel like a, a, a prime opportunity for us to engage in uh, conversations with astronomers there that aren't currently looking for NIAs to help with that effort. Uh, additionally, South Africa has great ties into the rest of the continent, and as you can see, Burkina Faso, Gabon, Namibia, and Zambia I had scientists all represented at that initial meeting. Uh, pretty exciting uh, first step there. Next slide, please. You may recall at the uh, idea synthesis, uh, we got to announce under uh, collaboration in the Grand Challenge, the first Space Act Agreement, and that was with Planetary Resources. Uh, today, I'm excited to be able to announce our second Space Act Agreement under uh, the Asteroid Grand Challenge, and, that, and that's with Space Gambit. Space Gambit uh, is a DARPA-funded activity, and they are uh, working to engage the maker and hacker spaces around the world uh, to, in, to think about opening up the frontiers of space. Former NASA chief technologist Mason Peck recognized the value of the maker community. He recognized that all of us here at NASA uh, and the industries that we work with are makers. We build things. We fly in space. We see a movement, uh, an energy, and an engagement by people that are getting tools that they have available to start building on their own. And so the second Space Act Agreement was a recognition of the power of this community. Our first couple of steps we want to engage in vir virtual maker meetups, recognizing that we need to hear from the community how they want to move forward. Uh, we also expect to call for projects to help with education and outreach. How do we communicate this story and this message more clearly and tap into that know-how within the maker community? Uh, another really exciting opportunity we're exploring with them is um, space exploration space exploration badges for young citizen scientists. How can we build a program of skill development that enables recognition um, and growth as we build the, the next group of asteroid hunters? And then finally, uh, in the very near term, we look to do a remotely controlled telescope hackathon, the idea of how does one build controllers to uh, improve the ability of, of telescopes to be pointed and directed. Now turning back to our first Space Act agreement, I'd like to have the next slide and, and the movie uh, to show you where we've gotten with the Planetary Resources Space Act agreement. So if I could have the movie, please. Our solar system is filled with asteroids. While most like to hang out in the asteroid belt, roughly between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, many have orbits that come close to, or sometimes even impact, Earth. With asteroids being the most plentiful objects in our solar system, you'd think they'd be easier to find. But if you look up at the night sky, even with a powerful telescope, the best you're going to get is a small dot that looks just like a star. Well then, how do scientists find asteroids? They compare a series of telescope images to see if anything in the picture moved relative to the others. If it does, then it might be an asteroid. Scientists used to do this comparison by hand, but there is now so much data that they need to use computer algorithms to sift through the data to try to make these initial detections. 
if they spot something, as scientists will then review the results to make sure it's accurate. And now, there are two potential issues with this process. One, if the computer misses something, then that asteroid won't get discovered this time around, leaving us vulnerable to potential asteroid impacts or missing out on opportunities like mining the asteroids for resources. The other is if you turn up the sensitivity on these algorithms, you end up with a lot of detections called false positives, with the computer mistakenly thinks some noise in the image or a speck of dust in the lens of the telescope is an asteroid. This causes a lot more work for the scientists who have to go back over all these images and correct any of those false positives. We need your help to improve the algorithms that are used to detect asteroids without grossly increasing the number of false positives. During these challenges, we will ask you to create algorithms that mimic how humans sort through data to discover asteroids, so organizations like NASA and Planetary Resources can rely on having the most accurate data in the world. This is why NASA and Planetary Resources are asking you to help with the hunt for asteroids. Join the competitors in the Asteroid Data Hunter Challenge, being launched on the TopCoder platform, brought to you through the Harvard NASA Tournament Lab. Your algorithm just might be what helps us detect an asteroid headed for Earth, or one of valuable resources that helps fuel future space missions deep into our solar system. Join the challenge today. So we announced in November the Space Act Agreement, uh, and then my colleague Jen Gostetic and I uh, had the privilege of announcing this challenge contest uh, on the 10th of March. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty exciting opportunity taking advantage of some of the open innovation resources that NASA already has in place, uh, utilizing the uh, NASA Tournament Lab and the partnership with Harvard and Top Coder to engage people that might not think that they can contribute to solving this problem or improving our ability to solve this problem. So we announced on the 10th and by, a, by a Monday of this week, on the 24th, we had almost 28,000 unique visitors to the website. You can see that's roughly about five times the level of interest that a contest earlier in the fall had received. We also have gotten nearly 400 uh, registrants that are competing in the first set of 10 challenge phases here. Uh, at this point, the, the first phase has not closed, so we haven't paid out any money. Uh, but the uh, really exciting and probably the area the, the, of the contest that'll get uh, a lot of the traction is on the 18th when we release the um, preliminary beta algorithm where people will start competing uh, to develop that algorithm that will hopefully uh, be able to match the human operator. And could I get the next slide, please? So if you're not a coder or a uh, maker, here's another way that you can potentially help with this effort. Um, with some EPO funds out of Lindley Johnson's organization to uh, Bob Holmes many years ago was a, a, an effort started um, called Isaac. And Bob Holmes then started working with uh, Dr. Patrick Miller, uh, who launched this Isaac program. In 2006, they only had five schools signed up. Uh, today, they have uh, 500 schools in over 70 countries. Uh, you've heard about some of our guests that are in the audience today. And it is uh, my great privilege to be able to invite up the Dillard Drive Middle School Asteroid Search Team. Can I have our next slide, please? Hi. My name is Katherine Rohrbaugh, and I'm a third year, seventh grade science teacher at Dillard Drive Middle School, located in Raleigh, North Carolina. To say that we are excited to be here today is a little bit of an understatement. With me here today, I have four of my brilliantly talented seventh grade students who I get to teach every day seventh grade science. First, I have Ryan Mitchell Bagley, Emily Hiller, 
Stephen Powell, and Yamir Johnson. I began this asteroid team back in November, and in January, we first did our first main belt asteroid search. And just two days ago, we began our first near-Earth asteroid search with the PanSTARRS Observatory. Next slide, please. We work for the International Astronomical Search Collaboration. During our first main belt asteroid search, there are a total of 29 universities and observatories participating. We're the only middle school in the world to participate in this division alone. There were six other countries, a total of 70 asteroids were observed, and we found four of those asteroids. Next slide, please. NASA's our mission is something NASA would like to achieve in the next decade. During this mission, NASA wants to find and erotically capture a near-Earth asteroid. We feel called by this asteroid initiative to help out. Through the Asteroid Grand Challenge, we want to help find the missing unknown asteroids. We have been learning a lot about these asteroids, and by doing these searches, potentially helping with missions like ARM and the Asteroid Grand Challenge, it allows us to grow our knowledge on these incredible space rocks. Next slide, please. We were extremely excited to have been invited to participate in the PanSTAR search. It's a big deal. In the last search, we had four asteroid confirmations. We are even more excited to be in the PanSTAR search because of the higher power telescope, which raises the chances of having an original discovery. Also, it's amazing that we are seventh graders participating in real life science like NASA's ARM and Asteroid Grand Challenge. It really is a great opportunity for all of us and I think I speak for everyone in our group when I say that we've learned a lot from this amazing experience. Next slide, please. On February 28th, PanSTARRS located a new asteroid called 2014 DX110, which was discovered, I mean, which was an Earth flyby. That is pretty cool because they found a t an asteroid with the same telescope we use and it gives us motivation and confidence that will lead us to try to find our own asteroid someday. And that it will lead us, oh yeah. and not only did it get discovered, it flew by Earth. That really puts into perspective that what we are doing is real science and how much of a big deal it is. It leads us to find our own asteroid someday. And now for the exciting part, what have we actually found? On January 14, 2014, we located 2005 XJA. On January 16, 2014, we located 2013 TB80. Next slide, please. On January 17th, we located 2014 BQ. On January 30th, 2014, we located 2013 XG22. We are extremely grateful for NASA for giving us, oh sorry, next slide please. We are extremely grateful for NASA for giving us this once in a lifetime opportunity. And we, and we hope, hope to see, see you, you next year. year. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I get my next slide, please? Pretty exciting to see that we're able to reach into the middle school and uh, get the, enthousi the enthusiasm and excitement to, to contribute on, in our missions. So if you're not a maker and you're not a coder and you're not a middle school student, we've got some more ways for you to be able to help with us. The International Space Apps Challenge will be running April 12 through 13 just a couple of weeks from now. Uh, there are five themes. Asteroids happens to be one of those themes. Uh, you can see uh, six asteroid-focused themes that uh, we'll be focusing on. Uh, it's a, a weekend-long event where people come together um, 
drink a lot of coffee, stay up late, work on solutions to problems that NASA has submitted to the global community. There are almost, there are over 100 cities around the, the world that will be participating. Uh, and in fact, the Create Your Own, uh, Make Your Own Asteroid movie came out of the uh, RFI. Eric DeYoung from JPL presented at the Idea Synthesis Workshop, and we've uh, opened up that effort to a, a space apps challenge. Uh, if interested in locations, you can go to that website down below and, and find a, a city near you or contribute virtually online. Uh, next slide, please. So looking forward, uh, what do we have in front of us for the grand challenge? Uh, I'd mentioned the makers. We attended the Maker Fair in New York City uh, last fall. We'll be in San Mateo uh, the 17th and 18th. Uh, expecting a bigger presence there. It's a, uh, almost double the size in terms of attendees. Uh, just amazed at what we saw. In fact, there was a, a participant in the announcement, the RFI announcement last June that ended up b getting a team together to build a CubeSat that they displayed in New York City. So there's no telling what we'll see uh, out in San Mateo. Uh, additionally, we started a, a Grand Challenge seminar series virtually to enable anyone around the world to tune in. Uh, we've had great talks from David Morrison, Lindley Johnson, and Paul Chodas. Uh, we've got one this Friday. Tune in, please, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Al Harris is going to talk about the neo population and impact frequency. If you can't make it, we are archiving them, so all those uh, talks will be available, and we've got about six more after this Friday, at least scheduled for now. Uh, we have a planning wiki where we've been engaging in two-way conversation. Ideas collected uh, help us figure out how the community wants to move forward because this is a, a group effort. You can see the uh, link there. Uh, and then finally, we're working towards an anniversary event uh, on the 18th of June. Um, not sure exactly what that's going to look like, but if you have some ideas, please share it with us either um, uh, online at the wiki or at our Twitter account, Asteroid GC. Can I get the next slide, please? In closing, um, I'd like to read a quote that I saw almost every day in my initial days at NASA when I started back in the 90s. Uh, and it was really impactful and, and powerful for uh, my growth and, and thinking. And it's a Teddy Roosevelt quote. Um, Far better is it to dare mighty things to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. I can say uh, confidently that we are daring mighty things today. And I can also say that I know that what we're doing is the right thing because I can look into the eyes of these young students and see the fire and, and enthusiasm that they're bringing to this effort. And uh, I want to thank them for coming up from North Carolina to uh, participate with us. And everybody that has uh, joined in the Grand Challenge effort, it has been uh, a wild ride so far and we look for uh, a great future together. And so with that, I will close and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. And let's hear one more round of applause for the greatest seventh grade class we've ever seen. Honestly, what were you doing in seventh grade? Because I wasn't doing that. Um, all right, so we're going to go to, uh, to Q&A and, uh, and exhaust uh, the rest of your questions that are out there. And then we'll uh, start to close down the event. But uh, do we have any further uh, community feedback or questions here in the audience? And let's get a microphone here. Um, Hi, Marshall Lubanks here again. I had a question about the secondary payloads, and I probably should have asked it then, but it didn't really occur to me. Is it in the in this document? Is that just does that describe anywhere? I know you said it was six U, I think, for inside the spacecraft, and twelve U for on the bus or something like that. Is that described anywhere? In particular, like if you had a secondary instrument. Things like the power available, the communications, and all like that—is that—is that described clearly somewhere? Like the uh, way the CASIS does one? it for um, the station. Musk, Andy, to take that one from the microphone here up front. 
And if not, can it be? Um, I believe it is described in the BAA in that section um, as to what the reference concept would, would could accommodate. But I think in terms of responses, um, I, I think you should come back with your ideas, okay. understanding that there's extremely limited yeah. capacity. So if we need a watt, we should just say we need a watt and, and that kind yes. of stuff. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Back behind you, Nicole. Hello again, Rick DeWitt. I have a question about solar electric propulsion. Um, how easily can it be throttled? Uh, is it basically turn it on and off like a light switch, or does it really need a warm-up time? I'm concerned about the enhanced gravity tractor. It's going to have to operate at less than 100% duty cycle. Mike? Um, there's not one answer for you, but I can tell you in terms of the technology efforts that NASA is currently working on, um, under STMD, those hull thrusters are throttleable. Um, now you have to have the correct control algorithms and electronics to do that. But um, for instance, that 2,000 to 3,000 second range ISP, we can throttle across that range. Um, it changes the thrust level. That it's more. Com I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but it's not just a binary switch. It's not just on and off. You can throttle the thrusters in an EP system. I'm sure you've looked at it. I just wanted to know. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Twitter. What do we have? We have a question about the uh, location of the asteroid after it's redirected. Why lunar orbit or uh, the Lagrange points? Wouldn't a high Earth orbit make investigation or exploration simpler? Steve? Sure, I'll, I'll try that one. Yeah, we, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at different locations to take the asteroid to, and we selected this uh, lunar distant retrograde orbit for really two reasons. One. It was a very stable orbit, so if we put the asteroid there in the, with the spacecraft, you could stay for about 80 years without doing any maneuvers. And secondly, you could get to it with Orion uh, on these early missions. So it was a nice sweet spot versus bringing it all the way into uh, to Earth orbit. A lot more energy required to bring that big, massive asteroid there. One here in the, in the middle. Hi, my name is uh, James Wanga from GoLab in New York City. And uh, the question I had was during the characterization phase, uh, you mentioned that there would be these one kilometer flybys at which you'd use 3D LIDAR to characterize the surface of the asteroid. I don't know a whole lot about LIDAR, but I'm concerned that at one kilometer flyby, you're not going to be able to do uh, a really precise sub-meter uh, characterization. And I was wondering if that is the case. Um, and if it is, is there uh, plans for some sort of secondary characterization um, of, you know, being able to determine, like the gentleman uh, earlier said, whether or not a boulder was indeed a small rubble pile or something like that? Dan okay, wants to take that. Dan. So to answer the question with respect to the characterization, that's not done using the LIDAR. That's done using the, um, the, the cameras, the optical cameras um, from a different, different um, angles. Um, the LIDAR would be done for the, the, uh, the close-up operations in, in, in both of the scenarios. And I'm sorry, was, was the second part, was there a second part of that question? Yeah, well, I, the, question, the question I had was, are you going to be able to build an accurate map of this uh, using the LIDAR? Or is that even the goal of the LIDAR? Um, it, it sounds like maybe it's more of a navigation tool. It, yeah, it's more of a navigation tool. Um, optically, with, with the cameras, we'll have sub-centimeter resolution. Um, do, well, while we do these dry runs for the, the boulder capture option, um, we'll come down close uh, after we've selected a series of candidate boulders, and then we'll get very high resolution images that we can build shape models and, uh, and um, uh, before we do the actual collection operation. Let's, let's get you, go, um, can you repeat oh, that last sorry. sentence? Yeah. Um, the reason I asked the question is because I thought it would be a great opportunity to do something like using planoptic lenses uh, that allow you to do optical 3D characterization without, uh, without LiDAR. And so if you're going to take pictures with a high resolution camera up close, um, doing something uh, you know, with a planoptic lens might, might offer some added advantage. But that was, I was just curious. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any techniques that we can um, uh, get information, including the shape, 3D, the surface features, um, will, be, will be beneficial. Okay, anything uh, further in the audience for questions? How about Twitter? 
We do have another one. Uh, from launch to humans exploring the asteroid in lunar orbit, how long will the mission take? It's a really good question. So we've looked at a lot of different uh, launch dates. So the mission takes around 26 to 28 days. So it basically takes uh, nine or 10 days to get out to the distant retrograde orbit. Then we spend about five days there and, and roughly 10 or 11 days back. So it varies between 26 to uh, 27 days, something like that. Okay, uh, I think we're gonna start to, uh, to transition here from, from Q&A to our final speaker. I really appreciate everyone's questions that we've gotten here so far in the audience and of course uh, online using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, and just a reminder, you can find all the presentations you saw today, more information, uh, some of the videos that we showed at nasa.gov slash asteroid uh, initiative and the presentations will be at slash asteroid forum. So you've heard a lot of uh, great ideas here. We've had a lot of uh, great feedback here to kind of help us put a a finer point on everything uh, for concluding remarks. It's my pleasure to introduce NASA's Associate Administrator, Robert Lightfoot. Robert, put him yours. Well, a great day for you guys. I've been watching from uh, my office up there in between meetings. Um, I hope you're as excited as I was to hear what these teams have been working on. They briefed me, I guess we spent 10 hours one day going through those in much more depth than you did, than you got to see. And um, I left the room extremely excited about what the team had done um, and, and where they're headed and what they're thinking. And, and so I hope you got to see the benefits of the, the hard work they've been doing, getting this mission refined, getting this concept refined as we get ready to go do this. Um, it's pretty exciting for me to stand here and think about how far they've come in just a year in terms of developing these capabilities, yes, to do this mission, but also to make sure that we're make we're, that all the things that we're working on are extensible to our real destination, which is Mars. So it's pretty exciting to see that as we go forward. Now, I will say this: what I didn't expect when I came down here was to was to hear you guys. How awesome is that? Um, you know, I, I I literally got pulled out of a budget meeting to come down here, and you can imagine budget meetings are kind of interesting, and so. <clears throat> So I, so I come down here from a budget meeting, and I want to go back to the budget meeting and tell them why we're doing what we're doing for you guys, so you guys can take over for us one day. Very excited to hear you guys and, and how excited you are about what we're doing. So thank you for being here. Really, really neat. You know, as Charlie told you earlier today, we we're, we're really are combining this into one team now. The teams are pulling together. The, um, <clears throat> we're working on center assignments. We're getting those put out to who's going to be working on what to get us to the mission concept review, all the different pieces that you've seen that the guys described earlier. This BAA is just another step for us uh, in that process for getting ready to go. I'm very confident that we're going to be able to come in when we, get our, when we finish all our estimates. We're going to come in at roughly half of what the Keck study said, which was the $2.5 billion. We're going to come in about roughly half of that. That's what we're shooting for from a goal perspective. Um, and I think the teams are going to show you that we can go do that. And frankly, utilize a lot of the existing things we're already working on, as you already heard. So it's a very exciting time for us. We think this does get us on the path to getting to Mars, builds that next set of capabilities, as, as Steve or, or Jason, I can't remember which one showed it, the, the, the capabilities that we need to take humans to Mars and to that ultimate destination. And uh, pretty exciting. And I'm just thrilled to see how many folks are here and glad you guys could come and be part of this, uh, this great event. So to Michelle and her team, where's Michelle? There she is. Michelle and Jen. Oh, this guy's is fantastic. Let me give you a couple of next steps that we've got just to give you an idea of what we're doing. Next chart. <clears throat> so as, we, as you've seen this chart many, many times, I love the pictures of the SLS is there on the right, uh, headed toward Mars. That's that's a lot of rockets. Uh, <clears throat> as a rocket engine guy, that's, that's, that's good stuff. So that, that's what, but that's what it takes. This is the guy I showed you. So this is our truly trying to get to Earth independence capability. That's what we want to go do um, from an agency standpoint. But we truly think this is the proving ground. This is our opportunity to do that from a proving ground perspective in, a, a, in this area around the moon. Next chart. So the next steps we've got, and you, you've heard most of these today, we want to get the inputs um, through this BAA to help us fold these into what we're going to be doing, <clears throat> whether it's the capture systems, the, the, the AR and D activity we're doing, or even how, how can we turn it, can we turn this into a commercial bus? Can we go do these kind of things to, uh, to, to enable more use of the capabilities we're building down the road? We've got to, 
fighting a cold here, guys, so hang with me. Um, the, so we're going to include the, the potential for the target opportunities that may serve the scientific and the partnership interest um, via the BAA. You're going to see this. Uh, keep working with the science communities and the key experts um, as we move forward to just refine these robotic concepts um, and, the, and the approach we want to do. We've got to advance the solar electric propulsion technology system. It's not just the thrusters, but it's the thrusters, the arrays, the power systems, it's all the pieces that go with that. And those have such application far beyond what we're trying to do with them on this mission. We really believe that's a, that's a very important piece. By the way, all these are things we were already working on, right? Now we're just putting them together in a way that, that allows us to do that. We got to do the risk mitigation activities. We're going to be doing those over the next few months um, for the for the uh, the capture and then the, the boulder concept that, that that they described earlier. And then, as Steve Stitch said, we're working on a lot of the risk assessment and risk reduction activities associated with getting the crew to the to the uh, asteroid. And hopefully, we'll get to a mission concept review um, sometime in early 2015. Uh, the teams again are, are they, we've, we've pulled them, we've turned them from a teams to a team, uh, and that's what we're going to go. We're going to go push forward for the next few months here uh, and get ready for that MCR. Next chart. Then on the grand challenge side of the house, as Jason described earlier, this is exactly what we're going to be doing. We've got the seminar series <clears throat> with Al Harris coming up, <coughs> and we're going to support the uh, International Space Apps Challenge, as, as Jason said earlier. And then these educational materials for the Amateur astronomers for, for NIAs is really important to us. Again, exactly what you heard earlier from these guys. We want to we get more people, more people involved, citizen science. That's, that's one of the coolest things we're getting from, from this effort. So again, we appreciate you guys being here. I hope one day you'll be able to sit here and say, hey, I was, I was in the Webb Auditorium when they took those first steps to getting towards Mars, when they started talking about this mission that we're going to go do and all the things we're doing. So thanks for being here uh, and work with us hard. Help us be successful here because we need your help and we want, we want you guys to be part of this team as we move forward. Thanks a bunch. Okay, so that's going to wrap it for the, uh, for the forum today. I uh, just really appreciate everyone uh, being here and for those of you watching online and to all our speakers. So again, you can follow along uh, as, as we progress. Uh, and these, these various components of the Asteroid Initiative by following nasa.gov slash asteroid initiative. Really appreciate all your questions on Twitter today using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, just a big thank you again to all of our speakers and the organizers of today's forum, and uh, thank you for all your questions and for joining us today. Thanks. <laughs>